welcome you to Paradox, an interdisciplinary symposium. I believe that we have a wonderful day ahead for you. Today's symposium, the second in a continuing series, was conceived by the LMU Medieval Monasticism Group, established to host scholarly conversations about monasticism across cultures and religions. The group began meeting in the spring of 2020 with the hope of fostering interdisciplinary discussion. We quickly latched on to the notion of paradox as a way of getting at centrally meaningful dimensions of the thought and practice of the Buddhist and Christian monks whom the group members study. You may not be surprised that once attuned to the topic of paradox, we began finding traces of it everywhere, bumping into paradox in the writing in writings popular and scholarly, pious and irreverent in the works of Zhu Wang Zhu, Kierkegaard and Dorothy Parker, among others. And in fact, just last night, I was reading with my daughter a high school research paper about the paradoxical aspects of ornamental gardens cultivated here in California in the Manzanar internment camp. We wondered if thinking paradoxically infiltrated the thought of the illustrious crowd I've mentioned and others, why not test its appeal here at LMU? We thus invited Loyola Marymount faculty and students to join in an interdisciplinary consideration of paradox. We're pleased to count among today's presenters a theologian, a poet, a literary theorist, and professor of Patrick Poetics, philosophers, a computer scientist, as well as at least two historians. Each took up the topic of paradox in her own way, in the context of her own work. We insisted on no one guiding definition, recognizing that paradox is an equivocal notion. However varied its meanings, I suggest we may wish to consider in the context of today's talk, examples of paradox, definitions of paradox, and paradox as attitude or orientation. To begin, consider the following example of paradox, words attributed to Christ. Those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Consider the following definition of paradox, a statement that is in some respect self-contradictory or self-refuting, but to some extent compelling nonetheless. Paradox may be more attitudinal than anything else, a sort of passion-infused buck the system way of thinking. Drawing on a long history that stretches back at least into the Middle Ages, as we will see, modern intellectuals often point to paradox as the mark of the creative thinker committed to upsetting habitual ways of perceiving reality so as to make room for surprise. Today's symposium will surely present other insights into the meaning of paradox and may upend those I have offered. We have a full day ahead, including three sessions and a keynote address, followed by a roundtable discussion. You should be able to find a program which also contains bios of our presenters in the chat box. Session one, the paradox of nothing, structures and disciplines, begin, begins at 1010. At 1020, session two will take up paradox, God, and the taming of evil. We break for lunch at 1235 and reconvene at 105 for session three on paradox, desire, and wonder. At 2.20, it will be a particular pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker, Asuka Sango, Associate Professor of Religion at Carleton College. We conclude with a roundtable discussion among our presenters. 
Please dart in and out of the day's offerings as you like, of course. It would be terrific, however, varied our schedules maybe, if we could try to reconvene at 2.20 for Professor Sango's talk on Buddhist debate in medieval Japan, its epistemic paradox and socio, so, uh, sorry, soteriological possibility. A couple of housekeeping matters. During the question and answer period at the end of each session, please try to raise your virtual hand using the Zoom function, and this will make it easier for us to identify you. If on the other hand, you have a question while presenters are speaking, please use the chat function. This will minimize distraction. In closing, I want to offer a very hearty thank you to Loyola Marymount University's Department of Theological Studies and to the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination, otherwise known as ACTI. I thank them for their joint sponsorship of our symposium. Emmy Lou Reyes, ACTI's Senior Administrative Coordinator, and ACTI Director Jose Garcia Moreno, together with my co-convener, Eric Swanson of the Department of Theological Studies, are responsible for laying the foundation, the groundwork for our symposium. Today's event was born out of a panel we actually held last fall on paradox and comparative monasticism, self and society in the Middle Ages, which I organized in my role as an ACTI fellow in collaboration with members of the medieval monasticism group, Diermut Branek and Eric Swanson. For this ACTI fellowship, I'm especially grateful. It allowed me to advance my research by providing a course remission at a critical phase in my writing uh, book on paradox. This gift of time is a real boon, and it thus gives me great pleasure to announce that ACTI's 2021-2022 fellowship cycle opens next week. This time around, the ACTI fellowship will privilege LMU faculty research related to one of several areas. First, deeper connections between the sciences and the Catholic Church. Second, sacramentality in the arts and sciences. Third, anti-racism. And fourth, LGBTQ plus community and spirituality. If you would like more information on the fellowship, please go to the website posted in the chat. In just a couple of minutes, we convene for our first session, Paradox of Nothing, Structures and Disciplines. I wish I could pause now to offer you a cup of coffee. I'll see you in just one moment at 1010 when Eric Swanson will open session one for us. So the time uh, has come and uh, the first session of our symposium is titled The Paradox of Nothing, Structures and Disciplines. Um, as we are on a tight schedule, uh, as much as I'd uh, like to offer uh, a full introduction uh, of each speaker, uh, instead, uh, we'd like to remind you that the link to our event page um, and a full bio of all the speakers today are in the chat. Um, so we uh, highly recommend that you check the, uh, the website throughout the day. So we will proceed uh, with each speaker giving a 20 minute presentation, followed by 10 minute Q&A after all three speakers have presented their work. Please feel free to send in questions in the chat uh, while you listen to the presentations. Uh, but if you could refrain from raising your hand or asking questions until we get to the Q&A session, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn things over to our first speaker, Professor Paul Harris from the English department here at LMU, whose presentation is titled, Nothing But Paradox, Paradoxes About Nothing. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, Anna, for a wonderful uh, introduction to the day. And uh, thank you, Jose and Acti, for uh, putting this together in the spirit of collaboration and dialogue across disciplines. And uh, I'm 
just uh, pleased as punch to be here. I, um, my abstract has a much more uh, scholarly sounding program for you than I ended up doing because uh, this is the last day, hooray, of the bear of a year that we have all uh, been through together. And so I thought it would be more suitable to do something a little more on the uh, amusing side and keep things a little lighter, but I'll address many of the issues that were in my abstract. I changed my title to Saying Nothing, Garden Variety Paradoxes. And uh, I'm really uh, a co-author. I lead a double life as Paul Harris when I teach English at Loyola Marymount. And when I enter a rock garden called the Petroverse, I become Pierre Jardin. And the two of us are uh, co-authors, as you will see this morning. So saying nothing. I teach a course about nothing. I've loved teaching this course and researching this topic over the years because it is so elusive. The moment of saying nothing, of course, we displace the nothingness and we say something. So uh, I find it very productive for students to think across disciplines and think questions that take them out of their habits. It's always been the same for me. I start class sometimes with this riddle. If anybody knows the answer to this riddle, you're free to unmute and say the answer. Actually, I'm, I, I just heard nothing. The <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Silence. Silence is the answer, but nothing could be the answer, right? It's, it's sort of an interesting both, but silence is technically the answer. And uh, I first saw that riddle in, in the Roberto Benigni film, Life is Beautiful, in the context of the Holocaust, Say My Name and I Disappear takes on a completely uh, different meaning, of course. So uh, I evoke this because of the uh, interplay of appearance and disappearance and language and silence that I think is central to paradoxes around nothing. Samuel Beckett is a high priest of nothing, waiting for Godot, as uh, I forget who said it, is a play in which nothing happens twice in each act once. And uh, he says it very well in Malloy. If I could speak and say nothing, really nothing, but it seems impossible to speak and yet say nothing. You think you've succeeded, but you always overlook something. I put on my course syllabus this wonderful passage from the great paradoxical writer, G.K. Chesterton. Uh, I call this doubling down because the repetition of the word nothing is a way to try to evoke it. Chesterton says, until we realize that things might not be, we cannot realize that things are. Until we see the background of darkness, we cannot admire the light as a single and created thing. As soon as we have seen that darkness, all light is lightning, sudden, blinding, and divine. It is one of the million jests of truth that we know nothing until we know nothing. I love this formulation for many reasons. Uh, until we really face absence, creation and life is not the blessing that it can be. To me, this is clearly a kind of apophatic or negative theological formulation of the creatio ex nihilio, the uh, fullness of God and the word erasing the nothingness that came before. We talk about uh, the Christian creation and Genesis in comparison with creation stories from indigenous tribes and cultures around the world. We also talk about uh, notions of void and emptiness as the matrix for creation in Buddhism and Taoism. And we also link it to uh, the quantum vacuum and ideas of zero energy universe and physics. So I start with this statement, nothing to avoid, but I actually start with that beautiful foot in diameter, very heavy mudstone that I collected in Palos Verdes with the perfect 
uh, O on it, the perfect circular shape. I think of it as a kind of ENSO. Rock collectors collect rocks with rings and think of them as ENSO stones, ENSO being the Buddhist symbol that is a contemplative act to draw it among its many complicated meanings is simply uh, the void. And so it begins, a zero sum game, saying nothing. A zero sum game evokes the zero energy universe among other things, where the sum total of matter and the negative energy of gravity add up to zero. Nothing to avoid. This way of trying to say nothing is to double up instead of double down. The emptiness of tautology is a way of saying nothing. An orbicular stone and circular statement form a formulation with an indisputable ring of tautological truth. That's my transition into garden varieties of paradox. This is the displacement garden at Loyola Marymount uh, next to the Burns in the Burns Art Complex. Uh, my friend Richard Turner and I did this in, for Slow LMU and the uh, Bellarmine Forum in 2016. And it's basically a riff on the uh, so-called Zen Garden, the Serensui Dry Landscape Garden, the most famous one being, of course, the Koanji in Kyoto, where uh, the interplay between stones and raked gravel evokes volumes and void and makes the void visible. We occupied the elephant cage with this, so we made a cage with a volume in it, and we displaced concrete here and put it in the cage to evoke the interplay between void here and volume here. The uh, didactic for this specifies that the ingredients of the garden include concrete rubble and concrete poetry, and that interplay between material and language is central to uh, this talk and thinking about nothing for me in general. So the concrete poem for the volume, the cage, is a very simple cubic concrete cage, the form replicating the cage to evoke the void that had the rectangular uh, pattern. I wrote these phrases, drawing a blank minding the gap, nothing to avoid. So drawing a blank, of course, is uh, that act of trying to think. And in that moment of drawing a blank, that blankness is that presence of emptiness or nothing. If you mind that gap, if you dwell in that, you can contemplate that. In drawing a blank, I always think of the act of inscribing and drawing a blank. And this is one of my favorite maps of nothing uh, ever done. Lewis Carroll's map of the ocean at the beginning of the hunting of the snark. Now I would like to uh, invite you to spend the rest of this presentation in the Petroverse of Pierre Jardin, a rock garden in Long Beach, California. You are seeing the birth of a Petroverse as it says in this uh, formation of stones. This was the logocentric act of creating a Petroverse by writing it. You are seeing the birth of a Petroverse as uh, something written with rocks in the act of reading it. Petroverse, you might ask, is a noun. It connotes a world composed of rocks. Petroverse, universe, a rock garden. It connotes words composed of or for rocks, verse written in or about stone. This practice, the birth of this word came with the conception of Pierre Jardin all at once. The phrase just came, the Petroverse of Pierre Jardin. As a world composed of rocks, it's a contemplative practice of rock garden that I think of as composition of place. I've written about this in relation to the Ignatian exercises combined with contemplative co composing with material. And I've written about this as a philosophy that evolves that I just call stoned thinking. As composition of verse, I think of this as Petric poetics, 
as trying to think about how language is changed and inflected by trying to deal with the blankness, what Robinson Jeffers called the stubborn silence of stones. The first composition in the Petroverse was nothing. This is the tagline of the Petroverse of Pierre Jardin, a rock garden where nothing is written in stone. On a figurative level, nothing is written in stone references the impermanence of the garden, the fact that displays appear and disappear unpredictably, and its overall design and aesthetic are in the constant process of revision. The Petroverse is never finished, but it's always complete. On a literal level, the Petroverse is a rock garden where nothing is written in stone. In the creation story of the garden, nothing was the lithic logos, the first word fashioned with beach cobbles. In a Southern California rock garden, nothing triggers Zen associations. It was placed in the yard as a kind of koan or a clue and a crossword that might trigger an associative response. Oh, nothing is written in stone. This was the seed of one of Pierre's prime, pithy, playful, paradoxical petroverses. Nothing just on its own triggers any number of associations and ideas. For some, that number might be zero, of course, but such people are not the pedestrians Pierre plays for, prays for. So it was put in the yard as an invitation to think, to invoke that phrase, nothing is written in stone. However, posterior to polling passers-by about the meaning of the mysterious message and finding that they had little or nothing to say, Pierre Jardin judged that a little nudge was in order. If people were to read a prompt, nothing, and be prompted to think, nothing is written in stone. This composition, is written, is unwritten, attempted to peak people's minds. This elliptical hint, nothing dot 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 in stone was given, in which the missing words is written or the words not written in stone or otherwise, to fill the blank with the writing. Finally, or is it, the composition was fully written out but with a twist, nothing is written in stone with a question mark, which evokes the questions that the Petroverse provokes because it is written in stone. The phrase is true. Nothing is written in stone. Yet when not written with rocks, the aphorism means that there's never anything that is written in stone. It states that something is never the case. Yet here it is the case that nothing is written in stone. So we have an interplay between the materiality of language and the literalness of stones. The act of writing in stone changes the medium. The proposition, nothing is written in stone, remains true, but the performative of writing with rocks falsifies it. The next iteration in nothing is written in stone was a textual intellectuals indexical lexicals. Nothing is written in stone, and so is this. As a professor of Petric poetics, Pierre Jardin is an aspiring textual intellectual. He explores and exploits the self-referential literal qualities of Petroverses and text messages, their tendency to indicate what is happening in the moment of speaking and use words whose meaning depends on context. There's a word for such words, indexicals. Indexicals are deictic, meaning they point to something. Words in the indexical lexicon include I, you, this, that, here, there, today, tomorrow, and now. The paradigmatic Petroverse, nothing is written in stone, was, giving a, was given a further twist when Jardin appended the indexical phrase, and so is this. The indexical this in the message, like paradoxical propositions, has different meanings that operate on tangled logical levels. It could refer to the single word this, or the phrase, so is this. 
Or so is this could self-referentially mean the entire message. Nothing is written in stone and so is this. The message creates another level of paradox and the contradiction between the confident assertion that nothing is written in stone, meaning that nothing is ever written in stone, and the baldly stated literal observation that this whole message, like the word nothing, is written in stone. This is a particularly emphatic lexical used to famous effect by Robert De Niro's character in The Deer Hunter, when he says, this is this. This is not something else. This is this. An Anthropocene, nothing in stone. A composition called, O oh, Things Written in Stone. The aphorism, nothing is written in stone, expresses a general sense that change is inevitable that attempts to secure permanence are bound to end in futility. This general truth may be turned back on the phrase itself in the sense that its sense proves not to be written in stone as it accrues additional layers of meaning and changes in the context of the Anthropocene. Conventionally, the phrase functions as a proposition that human aspirations to attain the permanence of stone are futile whether they be in the form of contracts or perpetuity or empire or duration in historical or cultural memory. The phrase draws an implicit dichotomy. Written means human and therefore erasable and subject to erosion, whereas stone denotes impervious to time and wear. These terms anchor an opposition then between temporal human mortality and history and a timeless seeming abyss of geologic time. The Anthropocene context com complicates the phrase's meaning, though, because it is defined by the entanglement of human and geologic timescales. And as human history is decentered by inhuman timescales, the geologic is conversely destabilized. Earth no longer serves as a ground, a given inert objects on which humans act or reference frame to which actions can be referred. Instead, the planet has become a changing system characterized by tectonic shifts, climate change, and ecological precarity. Francis Ponge, the magnificent 20th century French prose poet, wrote a very long text called The Pebble, in which he says, contrary to the customary view of it as a symbol of duration and impassibility, we may say that since stone does not recreate itself in nature, it is the only thing that is constantly dying. Nothing is written in stone then takes on a different sense. One could say that nothing is written in stone, including stone. Pierre Jardin's composition of the proposition expresses human geologic entanglement by recasting the range of the written to include geologic processes. The earth writes its history in stone in an archive called the rock record. In her wonderful book, geologist Marcia Bienerud, in Reading the Rocks, the Autobiography of Earth, characterizes rocks and landscapes as, quote, Earth's unsystematic chronicle of its past, its unintentional autobiography. She points out that while well, human autobiographies are inevitably the selective account of subjective consciousness, the one autobiography that's been recorded with no self-consciousness is the Earth's story literally written in stone. She acknowledges that to speak of reading the rock record is to anthropomorphize the planet. But she says that in reading the rock record, we may perhaps anthropomorphize the Earth a little if we also geomorphize ourselves, rediscovering the history of the Earth imprinted on us. Here, nothing is written in stone, is written in letters formed by pebbles and basalt shards from the Yuha Desert. The composition contradicts the conventional sense of the aphorism. Nothing can ever be written in stone, yet nothing is literally written in stone. More pointedly though, the written here extends beyond letters formed by arranging lithic materials, stones bearing round white rings formed by geophysical processes foreground the rock record as a form of writing. 
Cited in the place of the O's as nothing and stone, these traces assume a double sense. As zeros, they demonstrate that nothing is written in stone in a literal sense. Geophysical processes are writing nothing in minerals. As O's, they efface the difference between human and lithic constrictions. Nothing is written in stone in a limited sense, but in an expansive view, everything is written in stone if everything means the history of the planet. Writing becomes something that has unfolded for eons with human writing being only a very recent and differently evolved form of inscription. I'm at my time. I conclude the only way that seems appropriate. Word lattices created in the garden are designed to evoke contemplation and spur associations. So I will end with a short silence. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harris, for your for your presentation. That was really um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, presentation about nothing and yet abundant with content uh, that we could uh, hopefully talk about uh, during the uh, the discussion. Um, so uh, without um, so we'll save the discussion for the end of this session and we'll move on to our second uh, speaker, Professor uh, Jermund Abrahamnak, a postdoctoral instructor in theological studies and who will soon be starting a new position at the Chandler Gilbert Community College. So congratulations for your new position. Um, and the title of his talk is uh, ASI and Zen Paradox. Okay, my name is Jim Branock. Uh, today I will be presenting on Zen master ASI and the influence of the Indian Buddhist monastic codes uh, known as the Vinaya on ASI's work. Thus we can see the influence of the Vinaya and these Indian Buddhist codes on the development of Zen in Japan. So I would like to first thank uh, Dr. Swanson and Dr. Harrison for all the work they have done uh, to put this together. I would also sincerely like to thank everybody at ACTI for uh, all the work and support we have received uh, from them. And so uh, a little bit about myself. I was born in a, a small village in the north uh, west of Ireland called Gilnaleka. And to paraphrase an Irish tune, it's a long way from uh, Gilnaleka to Kyoto. And this is where uh, the study of Zen emerged from a Chinese context to become a centerpiece of Japanese culture. So this presentation will chart the key influences on ASI Zen with particular emphasis on how paradox inserts itself uh, almost inevitably into this story. So here at the edge of Loch Sheelan, here on the left, uh, a couple of minutes from my house, uh, first as a boy and then as a teenager, I would sit and ponder whatever reading had grabbed my attention that week. Um, was Edward Gibbon correct about the causes of the fall of the Roman Empire? Uh, can Prince Mishkin live in the world? And uh, more opportune uh, to what we are talking about, what is the sound of one hand clapping? This most famous, what is the sound of one hand clapping, the most famous of all Zen koans, served for me not as a riddle, uh, but as a guide. And it guided me uh, to the doors of the Department of Japanese Philosophy at Kyoto University. Now, uh, while I was there, I met the closest thing to a Zen master that I would find, uh, Dr. Koichi Sugimoto. And uh, Dr. Sugimoto is a rather extraordinary individual. He has a PhD in Japanese philosophy, but he also has lived uh, for 10 years uh, in this uh, building on the right here, Zen Juku. Uh, this is a lay monastic residence for um, mostly students who live here and uh, they live the life of a Zen monk while also participating in their daily activities. And so um, this extraordinary place has actually been, uh, is in the Rinzai Zen tradition 
uh, which ASI bought to Japan. And so what is the sound of one hand clapping? Um, it was during our many sessions of textual analysis in the research room of the Department of Japanese Philosophy that I first encountered in this critical context, this same koan, what is the sound of one hand clapping? And knowing full well that the koan, the koan is not to be tackled by the rational mind, this mysteriously powerless entity that we always hope will save us, even if it hasn't yet, uh, this simplistic indulgence demanded of Aristotelian logic, the world is a straightforward dualism that one cannot even think otherwise, simply collapses against the rigors of this koan. But my argument, of course, being steeped in philosophy, was that uh, if one accepts the categorical limitations of Aristotelian logic, which molds the mind to view the world as unrealistic dichotomies of true and false, I argue that one should instead adopt the technology of three valued or power consistent logic, and therefore one need not worry about koans. Interestingly, the evolution of philosophical logic and its application to religious doctrine was the subject of my first presentation on this topic at the LMU Medieval Monasticism Group on Paradox a group which, as you can see, has grown to become a symposium. So uh, great. But the power consistent logic, of course, also makes no dent in the koan. Uh, this is not uh, meant to uh, be subject to logical analysis. And so there was nothing left to do for me but to seek out a Zen master. And so I decided to seek out the first ever Japanese Zen master, uh, Myoan Esai. And so my first encounter with Esai, uh, whose dates are 1141 to 1215, was paradoxical in the sense that I came to realize he did not have much interest in paradox. And so we see that Zen, um, its identity maybe has been molded in ways that are not quite uh, accurate. Instead, I discovered uh, what I termed uh, Vinaya style morality and meditation as being the essence of Esai's Zen. So really, much of Esai's journey towards Zen for himself was motivated by a simple question. How do we combine serious moral discipline with meditation practice without focusing too much on one or the other form of practice? How do we combine? How do we unify morality with meditation? And so Esai's emphasis on morality, Shila in Sanskrit, rather than koan, and his willingness to mix Zen practices with other practices, to what we might call esoteric practices, tells us something very important about Esai, but also about Zen. This is in fact the Zen that Esai encountered in the Chinese monastic context, which he studied for four years. This is not the Zen we have come to expect. For almost a century, Western scholars and practitioners alike have been trying to define Zen in various ways, conjuring a realm of practice that mystifies as much as it illuminates. And yet the Esai Zen is not complicated nor mysterious. We will discuss it further, a little further down this road. But perhaps for now, we should bear in mind, what results do we see? What conclusions can we draw? Perhaps for me to jump over many possible scenarios, maybe let's cut to the end point. Esai is not a Zen Buddhist. He does not belong really to any category of Buddhism. He is simply a Buddhist and his goal is to overcome suffering. The, perhaps we should leave for the sectarian distinctions uh, for scholarly debate, but it seems to me that ASI is not really concerned with uh, which school he belongs to, that he's concerned with how to overcome suffering. And this is what I refer to as mixed practice, the practice between Zen and esoteric Buddhism. 
And so what this is probably the most famous image from the temple uh, ASI founded in Kyoto, Keninji. And this is the temp the image of the dragons intertwined on the ceiling of the Buddha hall. And there are many ways to interpret this. Interpretation is open. I interpret it as the intertwining of morality and meditation, naturally enough. So we get to the crux of what I'm arguing. I use the term Zen morality in my dissertation title. Many people who are not uh, aware of Buddhism uh, complained about this. I do not blame them. In fact, I understand completely because morality in the Western tradition often manifests as a judgment-based condemnation of behavior, a tallying of rights and wrongs fashioned into a stick to beat the poor bedraggled soul. Well, this is not what morality means in Esai. In Buddhism, the term morality, probably the most important term of all, has nothing to do with this idea of morality. But Zen has come down to us to mean something different. It was meant to be an escape from words like morality. And so Zen, as we know now, has become a form, at least as it is practiced here in America, a form of spiritual bypass, trivialized and reduced to a chilled out demeanor, accepting everything casually without worry. Much like how my own culture, that of Ireland, which dates the spiritual tradition that dates back at least 12,000 years, is nonetheless mocked and trivialized as being nothing but drinking, leprechauns and lucky charms. This is similar to how other cultures have been treated. White supremacist neoliberal discourse always thinks it can do this, but this serves only to mask its own degenerate and reactive cultural malaise. Zen is not about chilling out or transcending morality. In Zen as the Vinaya style practice advocated by Esai, we see that every daily action has moral significance. Everything one does, is potentially a source of karma. And therefore, the best way to ensure you do not act immorally and still maintain a meditation practice is to precisely on these everyday actions, see them as an opportunity to cultivate meditation and morality. Nobody is watching or judging you. Behavior is not condemned out of hand, but rather the intention towards yourself and others becomes the key to the barometer of a moral perspective. You gain benefit from correct behavior. Of course, the opposite is true. The body, speech, and mind can be our methods of freedom or our enslavement. And so, Esai Zen is what I term Vinaya style moral cultivation, a form of Zen morality, where Zen stands for concentration, meditation, and morality derived from Shila. Focusing on small matters of daily conduct and decorum can be a tool by which one develops their concentrated powers. What combines this practice with breathing meditation, the development of compassionate feelings and actions and activities and the realization of the emptiness of reality. This doctrine of emptiness, Prajna, is an end teaching. So not much for me to say about it. Uh, I guess we'll know it if we realize it. So let me repeat one more time, as you see here, breathing meditation, altruism, emptiness, and pure rules. We'll talk about those in a moment. All of these aspects are actually the core of what Zen is. So Zen morality is a sphere of behavior and meditation that quiets the mind and allows one e one's egotistical desires to dissolve by themselves. Morality is not about judging others, but about the development of the inner lamp of wisdom that erodes the darkness of the ego, the subject, the I, which fashions the universe into a small box of my family, my wealth, my reputation, and my achievements, and fails to even see that none of these things can be called yours. Most scholars seem to think that Zen, in uh, Chan, as properly known in China, uh, originated as a form of a hybrid Buddhist Taoist uh, practice. I do not consider the evidence for this to be strong. 
Um, I, uh, there are a small number of Japanese scholars, and I happen to agree with them, who argue that in fact Chan in China begins as a Vinaya style hermetic practice. Esai in some ways provides evidence for this. One of his key achievements is the introduction of the Chanyuan Qingui, the pure rules for Chan monasteries, uh, written in 1103. Esai brings them to Japan. These are rules and regulations that are um, based on a summary of Vinaya texts written by the Chinese commentator Daoshuan. But for many, many decades, Western scholarship was under the impression that these texts were original documents of the Chan school. And Esai himself seems perfectly aware that this is not the case. In fact, he argues uh, for pure rules on the basis of Daoshuan being uh, a Vinaya commentator and that these rules are therefore important to follow. So Chan, it seems, has always had links with the Vinaya in China, and now we see in Japan that something similar is occurring. Esai highlights these links and turns to Vinaya masters Daoshuan and Yijing to help elucidate the changes that have occurred regarding East Asian perspectives on the Indian practice of moral discipline. So here in this slide, you can see uh, how these two Vinaya masters influenced the two key texts Esai composed uh, about Zen on his return to J uh, Japan from China. So as we can see, Esai's uh, Zen is um, a practical means by which Japanese monks could learn a form of meditative morality. And so the Chanyuan Qingui, the pure rules for Chan monasteries become a key text. This text was based on a, as I mentioned, Daoshan's Vinaya commentaries. It's a very simple uh, set of rules for novice monks who wish to practice. And Esai's introduction of this text to Japan marks a sea change. While Esai himself is not considered a very famous Zen master, one of his uh, lineage, uh, Dogen, utilizes pure rules as the basis of his monastic complex and his uh, entire vision of Zen is based uh, primarily on pure rules as a function of daily morality. Not only the pure rules, but the work of Chinese Vinaya master Yijing and his travels to China in search or his travels to India in search of the Vinaya in the seventh century also inspire Esai. The first part of his work, uh, Shuke Taiko, is in fact basically a Japanese translation of Yi Jing's text. So we can see then on this slide, the interconnection between Vinaya, Chinese Vinaya commentators, Zen in Japan, and Esai and pure rules. Uh, the pure rules, the genealogy has been more or less completely ignored in Western scholarship on this topic. So the paper upon which this presentation uh, is based will hopefully redress this particular imbalance. And so it seems that ASI Zen is almost entirely devoid of paradox. ASI, the arch advocate of concrete moral proscriptions, alongside careful attention to meditative concentration. The Zen he has learned in the monasteries of China was the Zen which he had hoped to spread through Japan. Alas, the final paradox, ASI's legacy. Within 100 years, ASI's call for Zen precepts, what is known in Japanese as Zenkai, the cum cumulative study of Vinaya and Bodhisattva precepts. Unfortunately, this interpretation succumbed to a second interpretation. A commentator on Esai's works, Kokan Shiren, reinterprets entirely Esai's understanding of Zen precepts. He takes the word Zenkai and refashions it as a, rather than seeing it as a form of daily morality, he sees Zenkai as a ordination precept where one receives the mind of the Buddha 
the Zen mind and takes the Buddha as their moral exemplar. This process requires much more uh, moral fortitude, discipline, and imagination. This type of ordination is exactly the reason why ASI went to China to advocate for prescriptive daily rules of morality in the first place. So the irony or the paradox is that for the subsequent three to 400 years, people interpreted ASI in exactly the way that he wanted to avoid being interpreted, thanks to the work of Kokan Shir. Esai has also been overshadowed by one of his lineages, Zen Master Dogen, which is again, uh, something I wish to redress. Dogen is heavily influenced by Esai in many aspects of his uh, thinking. And so what is the sound of one hand clapping or some such koan? Where does this leave us? I cannot tell you whether or not solving this koan will lead you to the meaning of life. But for a young person in a village or an enclave or someone who doesn't know how to navigate this brutal capitalistic dystopia that we are now living in, I can recommend the works of ASI as a fine place to start. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much for your fabulous uh, presentation. Um, I think we'll uh, go ahead and uh, introduce the third speaker and then we'll save the rest of the time for our discussion. Um, so we'll turn uh, to uh, Professor Ray uh, Toll, uh, computer science at LMU. The title of his presentation is The Paradox That Led to the Founding of Computer Science as a Discipline. All right, thanks Eric. And thanks to Anna and Emmy Lou and Jose and everyone else who's here to visit. I have a talk on the paradox that led to the founding of computer science as a discipline. Would you be able to, would you be able to see if I hit the present button here? Yes, we can see that perfectly. Oh, excellent, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, let's get, let's get right into it. So, since I'm from computer science, I'd like to say a few words about the discipline itself. Uh, one nice thing about computer science is it's, it's kind of by nature a little bit interdisciplinary. It, it takes on a lot from philosophy. I, I tend to think of computer science as a branch of philosophy myself because we're interested in computer science about questions of, of knowledge and, and inference and, and truth. And philosophy, as most of us know, is the, you know, the the ways to work out thinking about things, you know, the search for the ways to think about truth, to reason about it, and, you know, to work out the right way to reason about things. But computer science also takes on a lot from mathematics because computer scientists like to do their reason symbolically. It shares a lot from linguistics because computer science is very much interested in in syntax, semantics, pragmatics, vocabularies, and, and grammars by which we can you know, organize knowledge to build ontologies and, and means for reasoning. There's a little bit involved from electrical engineering because in computer science, we like to do things fast and nothing's really as fast as light as far as we know. And if we can use light and electrons to symbolize our knowledge and, and put them together in nice ways to help us reason, we can amplify human thinking and make human and augment human thought in a way that wasn't really possible before. But computer science and computation is ultimately about, about people. Programs are written by people, for people, and to help us think about things and work out things and do things for people. Because we need models for computation, we sometimes look into neuroscience because you know the brain is a very fine architecture for, for thinking and reasoning, much different than the, the mechanical models that we, that we have in the past. So three ways that computer science is different from other fields is one, it's not really concerned with solving problems. I mean, personally, I kind of bristle when people talk about computer science as problem solving. You know, I'm a little less interested in solving specific problems, but it's more interesting to teach agents how to do general tasks. 
think about computing is more about performing tasks and not just performing individual tasks, but thinking about the general process for doing things and define it in such a way that agents can be taught to carry out those tasks. As I mentioned a minute ago, computing is very much about augmenting and amplifying human thought. And again, we do that by speeding up time. If we can, we don't need to spend all day trying to do something that can be done in seconds. Uh, finally, computer science is not a reductive discipline. And what do I mean by computer science not being reductive? Well, I, apologies to those that came to the last ACTI seminar, but I have to reuse this quote when talking about reduction emergence. And the I in ACTI, which is imagination, a famous computer scientist once expressed the difference between computer science and other disciplines by saying that scientists who work in material domains study the cosmos and all that is in it, reflect on the patterns they observe, then try to reduce their understandings to simplest principles. So there's a reductive element in that kind of imperial, empir empiricist uh, view of the world and trying to understand the cosmos through that lens. But he follows that by saying, I'm a computer scientist. I approach the cosmos through a very different path. I take the simplest of principles, information theory, logic, design, and from them create new worlds that are bound only by my imagination. Again, the, the I in act D. So computer science is interested in some big questions. One is, of course, well, there are the basic ones. What is information? What is computation? But more important, really, or more deeper, are the questions of what can we know through computation and what can we not know through computation? Our founder of the discipline, Alan Turing, among his many, many contributions to the discipline, is probably most famous for, well, not most famous, but had the most impact with, with two things. Right? So one is that he realized that programs, computations, these kind of ideas and things, these things we call programs, actually our data, there's, there's, no, there's no dualistic difference here between what are programs and what are data. We, we sometimes in the popular, popular thought, we think of hardware as being you know, physical and programs are these, these abstract ethereal ideas. They live in the world of ideas and they have no concrete representations, but that's actually not true. You know, programs are, they have to be written. You know, programs are a way to, to express yourself, to communicate to other people, just like you would write a recipe down. That recipe is, it's data and programs are actually the same thing. And you can probably see where this is going. If programs are data, then we can talk about programs reading themselves and all that other good stuff. So we're going to definitely lead to some paradoxes here. But, but this, this thinking really really was a really was a good one because it made available this notion of universal computation which is which is really kind of mind-blowing and what do we mean by Turing coming up with this idea of universal computation well if you put yourself back into the the world before the 1930s there was this thought that for anything you needed to do you would need to build or you could build a separate machine so for example, you could, build a, you could build a machine that would do accounting processes. Uh, you would build machines to do arithmetic. You would build machines to generate an index for a book. You could build a machine to compute whatever you needed to do for the military, which was a big user of computers back in the 1930s and 40s. But we just thought of, and, and even today, right? I mean, at least 10 years ago, we probably had alarm clocks and watches and calendars and reminders. And we just had all these different kinds of devices. And you know, now we tend to just put them on our phones. But this was the thinking before the 1930s that we would need a machine for everything. And the idea that programs themselves were data means that you could build this universal computing machine and just send in programs written down in some some particular language, and this universal machine would actually do what that other machine would do directly. And so this idea of a, 
a single universal computer uh, uh, arose. And, and this is really just in the 1930s. This is something we just take for granted today. I mean, everybody today, alive today, just understands, well, a computer can do anything. I just need to program it. But this was an incredibly mind-blowing thought back in the day. So what do we mean by a, by a program? Okay, well, a program you can think of as, as kind of a recipe. And as a first example of a program, let's try and get a robot to walk to a wall. But here's a key idea. This is one of the most important things about computing and why it's interesting and also why it might lead to paradox, but also why it's fun and useful and why it's had such a big impact on human society is that when we do write a program, the programs we write aren't, aren't always very specific in terms of the data that they use. For example, if I write a program to get a robot to walk to a wall, we write the program not to move a particular robot to a particular wall. We want to abstract the notion of what it means for robots to walk to walls into a, into a, a process, a program, an algorithm, what have you, that can operate on any robot in any wall. The, the super technical term for that is a parameter. <laughs> so a program that gets a robot to walk to a wall says for any robot, and I use, actually, you know, in programming, we would actually spell out the word robot and spell out the word wall, but I kind of ran out of space on these slides. So let's just use R to stand for an arbitrary robot and W for an arbitrary wall. And how do you get an arbitrary robot to walk to an arbitrary wall? Well, it's a three-step process. Step one is if the robot's already there, well, your, your program is done. This program halts, it stops, it's, it's over. You've, you've done what you wanted to do. Otherwise, you make the robot take one step forward. And then there's a step that says, go back to step one. Again, uh, yeah, well, well, these steps are kind of self-referential, but you know, that's what kind of makes them fun. But the point is, we can write this down in English, in any human language, with any set of symbols. Programs themselves are physical because they have a symbolic representation. But we'll flashback to Paul's talk about how nothing, you know, is uh, can be represented with symbols, N-O-T-H-I-N-G in English, for example. So always dealing with representations of things that we think are ethereal, but we can, as humans, give them symbolic representations. And that's kind of interesting. So we have this first program. Any arbitrary robot can walk to any arbitrary wall, and this program can be represented as text. And once you have this idea that programs themselves can be represented as text, you want to start asking questions about the programs themselves. We showed earlier that, or I, I mentioned earlier, I should say, that trying to get a robot to walk to a wall is a program that will stop or halt when that robot reaches a wall. So I might want to ask the question, if I had a particular program like walk to wall, and they had a particular robot in a particular wall here represented with X, it might make sense for me to ask the question whether or not that program would, would stop. And if you can picture a robot facing a wall and you applied that algorithm to that robot, that that robot would keep taking one step forward until it hit that wall and that algorithm would stop. So under certain conditions, the walk to wall program does halt, like if the robot is facing the wall that program will halt. And, and if the robot was facing backwards away from the wall, uh, you can imagine that robot would keep walking backwards away from the wall forever and not halt, you know, modulo the curvature of the earth or anything like that. But put yourself in a different kind of environment where the universe does go on forever. And that would be an example of a program that, say, does not halt. So you might want to say, hey, can I write a program that would determine whether another program would ever halt or keep running forever on certain inputs. And let's just right now imagine this, because this, this is something Turing did, right? Because Turing was interested in, in questions of computation. He was interested in what could computers do, what could computers not do, what kind of reasoning can we capture in text and reason about in this systematic, formal, step-by-step -step process? He was interested in that. 
And it was Turing that came up with this idea of, can we write a program to determine whether or not other programs would halt or run forever under certain conditions? This, this was his imagination step, right? Just, just like Einstein imagining what it would be like to ride on a, on a light wave, you know, Turing imagined what it would be like to write a program to determine whether or not programs would run forever or not. So let's imagine that this program could, could, could exist. Let's imagine that, that that program exists. And then we have our friend, the Fox here. And Fox is gonna write its own program. And the Fox says, well, you know what? I, I have a program, okay? So you just give me a program and my program is gonna do the following. I'm gonna ask if your program will run to completion given itself its own representation, its own text as input. And if it does, if your if you're halting determining program says that that program halts on its own input, then I'm gonna just keep asking that question, okay? If your program tells me it halts, well, I'm gonna keep running. I'm the fox, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna keep running forever if you tell me that it halts. But, but if you tell me that this program will not halt, if you tell me that your program is going to run forever and ever and ever, then I'm going to stop. Okay, so I'm going to do the opposite of what you tell me, right? If your your halting function says your program is going to stop, I'm going to keep going. But if you tell me that uh, this program should run forever, then I am going to stop. You know, because foxes are clever; they they always want to trick you, right? So why did the fox do this? Or technically, why did, why did Turing do this? Right? But what does the fox say? Well, the cool thing about what the fox has just done over here is, yes, our old friend self-reference can come into play. And the fox can give you a big ha-ha you know, by saying, all right, what does the fox program do when, um, when given fox? Right? So fox says, well, so, so I'm going to do for myself. And, re and remember that. The fox does the opposite of what Holtz does. So if you ask the fox what the fox does on itself, it says, well, all right, if you tell me that fox fox halts, I'm going to go to step one. In other words, going on forever and ever, otherwise stopping. So this is, this is where the paradox comes from, right? Because what is the meaning of fox fox? The meaning of fox fox is to run forever if your assumed halting function says that you halt, Fox Fox is gonna run forever, otherwise it's gonna stop. So this is one of those classic paradoxes because we can, we can say the following, does Fox Fox halt? You know, well, if our halting function says it does, then it won't, it's gonna keep on running. But if our halting function says that Fox Fox will not stop, then Fox Fox will stop. So, you know, it halts if it doesn't, it, it loops forever if it does, you know, this is classic. This is Russell's paradox. This is the, this sentence is false. This is what happens when you have self-reference, right? Every time you posit, you know, the deity that can know everything or a person that can know everything or a computer that could compute everything or the mathematical process that can prove everything, right? Everything and nothing are, are classic. Classic uh, creators of, of paradox, right? Knowing everything, proving everything, computing everything. So in a way, this isn't really too surprising, but it is interesting for a couple of reasons, right? Because when we when we we run into this Fox function, we might wonder, hey, well, wait a minute, maybe a program can both halt and not halt. Maybe that maybe that's okay, right? After all, you know, the Tchaikovsky, we have ideas of you know, programs halting, not halting, or both halting and not halting, or neither halting or not halting. You know, we have, there are four cornered logics. I mean, they exist. And in fact, in fact, even though computer science is somewhat misunderstood by dealing exclusively in bivalent logics where everything is true and false, uh, it, when you get past the first or second year of computer science education, you run into paraconsistent logics, adaptive logics, fuzzy logics, many-valued logics. The, 
the interesting thing about where the bivalent or you know the, the, the two-part logics come in is that's what the machines are built on. And I think what's interesting about a lot of this and why it might be interesting to uh, talk at the round table is that from a bivalent logic, from a little electronic gates that are either true or false, we can naturally build that pair consistent adaptive modal many valued and, and, and fuzzy logics. We just we just have this kind of yes no things at the at the core, and this is this is no different from building a reliable internet over on top of unreliable components to build conscious beings out of unconscious entities to have flowing water created from non wet individual water molecules and and how life arises from inanimate matter. So it's just another way of looking at. at things that we tend to think about in, in philosophy and the like. But can a program both halt and not, not halt? In computing, we tend to say, well, you know, the Chichisquati is, is very cool and everything, and many value logics are pretty cool. But, you know, when we're dealing with questions this self-contradictory, we tend to resolve this paradox by saying, no, you know, we don't, to, for a program to both halt and not halt is a little too esoteric over here. The best way out of this paradox is to say your assumption that you could write a function to determine whether or not another program did halt, stop, or versus running forever. It, we just say that that assumption was wrong because that assumption led to something that was self-contradictory. And what's really interesting about how when, when Turing did this is this same line of reasoning turned out to be usable to show that many other problems, both in computing and, and outside of computing, had no computational solution. So problems like, is a given grammar ambiguous? Do these two grammars specify the same language? A lot of questions in linguistics turn out to be, as we say, uncomputable, undecidable. No algorithm can exist to solve these problems. They're just outside of what can be done with this idea of computation as a step-by-step -step process grounded in time. So therefore, we can say, well, therefore, computer science is an interesting, creative human endeavor because it has limits and constraints, right? From con constraints are what drive creativity. We have some constraints on what can or cannot be computed. And therefore, uh, we do have a, a discipline. And Turing's work was one in which uh, can kind of gave rise to the fact that computer science was an interesting discipline in its own right. And that's what I have. I'm interested to hear more from others and ask about other people's talks in the round table later. So good stuff in the chat. Yes, yeah, set of all sets, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, really fascinating uh, presentation. And I think this first session really kind of illustrates the goal uh, that we had, the interdisciplinary aspect of this, of this symposium. And, uh, so I think that um, uh, at this point, uh, we only have about five minutes for Q&A, uh, which isn't very much. But uh, if you have any questions, uh, either specifically for any of the speakers or uh, would be interested in posing a, a question for the entire um, uh, first session, uh, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, and I know that there's also been questions uh, in the chat as well. So if any of the speakers would like to uh, address any of the uh, questions um, in the chat, uh, please feel free to do so as well. Um, but I do want to first uh, see if anybody would be interested in um, raising their hand and asking a question. So if I could maybe uh, just step in as a moderator, uh, and uh, um, I think that the uh, um, the last presentation by Professor Toll ended on a really interesting note of computer science has limits and constraints, and is thus creative human endeavor and a real discipline. And I think that really kind of loops back really well to what he opened up with, with the question of what can we know and what can we not know, uh, and how paradox is actually fun and useful. Um, and so I think this has uh, resonances with what the other uh, presenters talked about as well, uh, and thinking about what are the limits of our, our knowledge and our perceptions. 
um, and how do we push those boundaries, right? Uh, and so maybe kind of a, a general question for the entire speakers, um, if there is a function of paradox uh, and the function is to kind of push those boundaries, uh, what does that look like? Uh, if you can kind of maybe elaborate a little bit more on that in your own particular disciplines or your, um, or your, your just, uh, yeah, in your studies. Uh, so this is just a very broad question for anybody who wants to respond. All right, all right, I'll go. It, paradox is what, what actually defines the limits because when you, if you're a mathematician and you say, I want to, I want to prove everything that is, that is, that is true. You know, we, mathematicians have no problem knowing that that's impossible. I mean, that's, that's, that's was also shown in the 1930s, which was like a big decade for, for this, this kind of thought. And I think we're fine with that right now, but it always seems to be the case that limits of provability, limits of computation, limits of reasoning, it seems like those limits are almost defined by paradox as you go as far as you can until something is paradoxical or you have some kind of self-reference leading to a contradiction. And you say, it's hard to know. I think that they kind of define the limits. Mm. But what's even more interesting is if you want to break those limits, like let's say in computing, for example, right? Computing has been very much defined by this idea of machines. We think of computers as machines and machines are very step-by-step. -step. And our whole thinking about machines probably comes from the industrial revolution. But now that we know more about biology, we're thinking, you know what, is the cell really a machine or is it more of a system? It's more of the trillions of cells are all kind of working together. They're not centrally coordinated. They don't go in lockstep. You know, physicists, most of the scientists are fine with this. Philosophers and have known this forever. You know, there's, it's, everything's always changing. There's always flow. Then why, if, if, as long as we're going to limit mathematics and computation to being step by step by step, and their inference is going to be very linear, then we're going to be stuck with the same paradox as we know. What I'd, what I'd like to see someday is for us to just come up with a completely new model of, of reasoning and thinking that just goes beyond that. But I think if we do that, there will be another set of paradoxes waiting at the end, and then we'll have to come up with any new model that transcends mechanical thinking. That's, that's just my thought. I, I don't, I don't yeah. Just briefly, you know, paradox is inherently uh, an invitation to thank the next meta language because it makes any yeah. frame visible. Yeah. Uh, it's the difference to me between game and play, right? Play is a meta uh, discourse of being outside the frame of the game and the rules. Um, and constraints producing creativity. I, I, I teach a core course in creative experience called uh, creativity under constraints about constraint-based writing. Constraints is what pushes people and systems and language out of its usual functioning and gets to places where you haven't been before. And that certainly is the function of uh, paradox. Just a really uh, hugely general remark, but in answer to David's observation in the chat further back when I was talking about Elizabeth Anscombe, home and her uh, work on indexicals. So uh, she basically said that, and I, I just looked this up, so I'm just having this thought, but uh, she said that the pronoun I is, a, is immune to reference failure. It can never not refer to something. And because it can refer to anything, it means nothing. And there's, so there's a weird emptying out of the I in analytic philosophy of language that could be mapped to the emptying out of the I in some of the traditions that uh, we heard about spoken, uh, you know, and we'll hear more from later on. So it's just a really uh, kind of conceptual associative analogy, but uh, it is a really interesting thought actually. I think that's that's really um, uh, fascinating, and it actually leads quite well into the first speaker for our next session, uh, which we have uh, David Kovacs. This statement is false, written on the background, um, and uh, and also for themes to discuss for our roundtable uh, at the end of the day. Um, so at this point, I want to uh, transition to our break time. Uh, we'll have a five-minute break. 
Um, so please feel free to turn off your uh, videos uh, uh, and take a quick uh, uh, break. And then uh, we'll see you back at 11.25. And uh, uh, special thanks to the three speakers for uh, opening up our uh, symposium on a, on a really great start. I'm very pleased to introduce our second session of the day. Uh, as you can see, titled Paradox, God, and the Taming of Evil. And our first speaker is David Kovach, Department of Philosophy, who will speak to us about liars, lying, and the underlying truths of the Eucharist. Dave. Hello, good morning. And welcome to your living room or wherever you are right now. <laughs> uh, so what I'd like to do today, <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you a story about my friend, Jackie. Uh, now Jackie, in fact, is a composite character made out of several real people. Uh, since Jackie is in fact several real people, uh, they'll use the, the pronoun they and them. Now to understand, Jackie's situation, we need to understand some of Jackie's intellectual commitments here. These are beliefs Jackie has and ain't given up easily. And they're roughly divided into two groups. There's Jackie's philosophical commitments, for Jackie is a serious philosopher. And there's Jackie's religious commitments, for Jackie is a practicing Roman Catholic. Now the most um, serious commitment that Jackie has here, and I think it's one that pretty much everyone has um, really, uh, in philosophy, it's called the principle of excluded middle. It states that any meaningful statement will be either true or false, but never both. There's really nothing mystical here. The idea is that if you tell me something, what you've told me is either true or it isn't, or you've just not told me anything. Um, an example of a statement that doesn't tell me anything would be something like February is shinier than dignity. Is that true or false? It's just meaningless. You haven't said anything. Uh, now, before getting to Jackie's other philosophical commitments, let me tell you about Jackie's religious commitments. And for the purposes of this story, the most serious religious commitment that Jackie has has to do with the Roman Catholic sacrament of the Eucharist. And for those of you who don't know, uh, the night before he died, Jesus took a final meal with his disciples. He took bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, this, take this, this is my body, he said over the bread. And then similarly with wine, he said, this is the blood of my covenant. And to this day, Catholics reenact that meal at mass when the priest blesses the bread and wine. And importantly, Catholics take that statement of Jesus, this is my body, this is my blood, very seriously. And this is Jackie's next commitment, the Roman Catholic teaching of the real presence. This states that at mass, there is some real, some literal sense, some non-metaphorical sense in which bread and wine cease to be bread and wine. And what's present is truly the body and blood of Christ. Now the real presence, uh, it's a pretty dark doctrine. Um, what the priest blesses on the altar looks, tastes, smells nothing like anything other than bread and wine. It looks nothing like flesh or blood. If you take it to a lab and you dissect it, every chemist in the world will tell you that what you have is bread and wine, not flesh and blood. So what's going on? Is Jackie stupid? Well, Jackie hasn't been worried too much about this because for several years now, Jackie has accepted the, uh, Thomistic interpretation of the Catholic doctrine of real presence. <clears throat> uh, it's a theory called transubstantiation. It was championed by Thomas Aquinas. He wasn't the first to come up with it. Uh, but the Aquinas's Aquinas uh, Thomism has to do with Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Aquinas said that what happens at the Eucharist is the substance of the bread and wine cease to be. They become the substance of the body and blood of Christ while the accidental features of bread and wine remain. So this leads us to Jackie's fourth commitment, because if Jackie's going to accept transubstantiation, Jackie's gonna to have to accept something about substances and accidents. Let me tell you what those big philosophy words mean. Uh, 
substances and accidents, this is a distinction goes back to Aristotle, uh, Aquinas championed it. Uh, let me try to explain it by way of an example here. Take my cat, Mr. Whiskers. She's a substance. She's a substance that has lots of accidental features. For example, her weight, her height, her color, her bad temperature, her love of wet food. Those are all accidental features that Mr. Whiskers has. Accidental features are the facts about a thing that can change without changing the kind of thing that we're talking about. Mr. Whiskers loses weight, I dye her hair, I shave her fur off, she changes her behavior. She's still a cat. Her substance is her kitty catness. Everything else that you say about her will be an accidental feature. So this Thomistic interpretation of transubstantiation is very convenient. Why does the Eucharist look, taste, smell, feel nothing like flesh and blood, everything like bread and wine? Because on the theory that Jackie's been accepting, transubstantiation, the accidental features of bread and wine, like how they look, how they taste, feel, those are still there. What's changed is the substance, the part that conveniently you don't see. Brief aside, uh, if Aquinas' uh, transubstantiation feels ad hoc, um, I don't really hold that against Aquinas. There's a good reason to think that what Aquinas was trying to do um, was show that uh, real presence is not an outright absurd contradiction. He may not have been trying to show that uh, this was the most plausible way of understanding real presence. Now, if Jackie's going to accept the theory of transubstantiation, like I said, Jackie's going to have to accept one more thing, namely that this idea of substance and accident, that those are real distinctions, that they're real in the world. This is some kind of realism. Uh, there's lots of versions of realism. I'm not gonna get into them today. Some are weirder than others. Uh, what I want to stress is that for Jackie, one of Jackie's commitments is that uh, the distinction between substance and accident is real. Let me try to explain what I mean here. Compare a state statement like uh, cats meow versus senior citizens prefer dark comedies. Okay, and that later statement about senior citizens and dark comedies, you might very well think that everything in that statement is just a matter of convention. It's a matter of how we talk, right? We could change the law about what a senior citizen is. We could have difference of opinion about what a dark comedy is. Cats meow, that looks like a little more of a natural claim. Cats are there in the world. We don't vote on what is or isn't a cat. Uh, the idea behind realism is that uh, substances and accidents, these are natural kinds, right? They don't come about as a matter of social convention or a, a result of speaking, talking, something like that. The idea that those distinctions are entirely verbal or entirely conventional, that's called nominalism. That's the opposite of the realism that Jackie has henceforth accepted. So as Jackie's story begins, Jackie has four commitments. Principle of excluded middle, real presence. Real presence leads to transubstantiation. Transubstantiation leads to realism. But one day, Jackie discovered a book about medieval logic. Much to Jackie's fascination, remember Jackie's a serious philosopher, 14th century logicians, Jackie discovered, were very interested in liars' paradoxes, right? Sentences like, this statement is false. Uh, since we're all here to talk about paradoxes today, I'm not going to dwell on what the problem is here. I'm sure you all see it, right? But if Jackie's committed to the principle of excluded middle, that meaningful statements are either true or false, never both, what's Jackie going to do with this? Jackie discovered in the study of medieval logic that there were basically two camps by the 14th century regarding liar's paradox. Oh, I mean, they were obsessed with this. In the, they had, they, they listed some 14 different kinds of liar paradoxes in the 14th century. This sentence is false. What about every sentence is false? Then they were worried about sentences like every sentence is true. I mean, they really, they really, they punched every bit of uh, energy they could out of this. Well, one theory in the 14th century about liar's paradoxes, we'll call them the prohibitionists. They said, just don't say that sentence. 
there, we've solved the liar's paradox. Just don't ever say that sentence again. Uh, when students ask about this, by the way, I, I, it's not like the inquisition or something like that. It's more like a university professors agreeing that the next time a smart allocate grad student asks about the liar's paradox, they were allowed to say, go fuck yourself. Uh, the other school, the other theory about liar's paradoxes tried to argue that it's just false. The statement is false. Is it true or false? The answer is false. Now, Jackie, like lots of people, didn't like the no more questions approach to liar's paradoxes. Uh, it feels very ad hoc. It doesn't feel very well motivated. It feels like it doesn't really answer the, the, the question at hand. So naturally, Jackie looked to the other logicians who had more definitive solutions about this sentence is false. And Jackie discovered that one of the best solutions to the liar's paradox came from a Parisian secular cleric named Jean Beridan. Now, I'm going to have to skip over the technical details of Buridan's argument, but the gist of his findings goes something like this. Every statement virtually entails, that's the, that's the fancy move, virtual entailment, virtually entails other statements. Uh, for example, the statement, this statement contains five words. It virtually entails something like the statement, that statement I just uttered was in fact a statement. Now, Buridan, to solve the liar's paradox, said that any statement and its virtual entailments cannot contradict each other. And that wasn't very controversial. But Buridan said, this statement, this statement is false, virtually entails another statement. Because every statement virtually entails something like that statement was true. So when I say something like, uh, I, I had tea for breakfast, I virtually entailed the statement I made about my breakfast was true. So this statement, the statement is false, virtually entails the statement I just said is true. Those contradict each other. Therefore, the original statement was false. Great. So what's Jackie's problem? Jackie's problem was for Buridan to get to that virtual entailment stuff, Buridan, like many 14th century logicians, had to buy into nominalism, had to jettison realism. <coughs> Buridan had to accept that the substance accident distinction, its basis was more in convention, more in speech than in reality. But if that's true, what's Jackie gonna do about transubstantiation? Transubstantiation assumes that the substance accident distinction is real. And if Jackie can't have transubstantiation, what about the real presence? So if you've fallen asleep so far, let me summarize the story one more time real quick here. I know there was a lot of buildup. Here it comes. Jackie begins with the commitment, every meaningful statement, true or false. Jackie asks about liar's paradoxes. Jackie discovers that liar's paradoxes can conform to the principle of excluded middle. How? Just abandon realism. Just abandon the idea that the substance accident distinction has any basis in reality. But transubstantiation assumes the substance accident distinction. And Jackie has thought hitherto that transubstantiation is the best way of understanding the Catholic commitment to real presence. What's Jackie going to do? And this is the part that I'm hoping some of you will help me with. Um, we can jettison any uh, one of these four commitments, and, and I, you know, the, the Buddhists here might say we should jettison all four. Um, my question is, though, what, what should Jackie jettison? And I'm, I'm tempted to say it's transubstantiation, it's Thomistic transubstantiation. I think that if Jackie wants to be a consistent Catholic, what Jackie should be looking for are other ways to understand Catholic real presence. These will be ways that avoid, <clears throat> on the one hand, reducing the Eucharist to metaphor and pure symbolism. Um, on the other hand, you want to avoid the error of trying to claim that there's some sort of you know, chemical change that's happened. And it's such a profound chemical change that not even the chemists can find it. <clears throat> now, I don't really have time um, to spell out a whole new theory of the Eucharist today. Um, but I want to propose, uh, and perhaps during our discussion, we can have some, some conversation about this. 
I want to propose that a, a way forward on the Eucharist requires thinking about what I call the sacramental paradox. It seems to me that Jesus wanted Christianity to be a despiritualized religion. And by the way, I have no objection to calling Jesus the founder of Christianity. Uh, but it seems to me that Jesus wanted to despiritualize uh, the community. This is my body, he says over bread. I think Jesus wants to emphasize, um, it was always part and parcel of Christianity that our salvation comes about at the price of a body, at the price of something physical, something material. Human beings are not disembodied angels waiting to be saved by some invisible God. It seems to me that the sacramental paradox that I'm trying to, to work out some thoughts on is that what we call our spiritual lives is inextricably wrapped up, bound up with the physical, the material. Don't look for salvation in some invisible, immaterial, ethereal world. It's here and now. It's in the physical stuff, the bread and wine, the life-giving stuff, uh, uh, what, what, what we've always seen as life-giving, food, drink, is still life-giving, but on some other level. Um, so that's the, the theory of the Eucharist I want to see if I can't work out that will get Jackie out of this dilemma. Uh, that's, that's what I'm hoping we'll talk about during the uh, conversation at the end. I promised Anna Harrison I would finish two minutes short. So here I am. Well, you are not a liar. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, uh, David, for that. Uh, I'm so happy now to uh, turn us over to Eric Haruki Swanson, who is going to speak to us about the Buddhist Lord of Desire and the paradox of enlightenment in medieval Japan. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Anna, for the, the, uh, the introduction. And uh, I want to first of all thank uh, ACTI's co-sponsorship along with uh, Theological Studies Department for this really wonderful gathering. Uh, thank you, Jose and Emilio, for making this happen and, uh, and Anna for summoning us all together uh, today. So the uh, title of my talk is uh, The Buddhist Lord of Desire and the Paradox of Enlightenment in Medieval Japan. Uh, and it actually kind of uh, is a nice transition from what uh, was ended in David's uh, of people are not disembodied and wrapped up in their physical world. And I think uh, we're going to uh, hopefully see a little bit of parallels, even though we're going to be in a very different uh, medieval uh, context. Um, so my talk today will focus on this particular uh, Buddhist deity, the Aizen Myo -o, or the Raga Raja. Um, and the Aizen Myo -o is a wrathful deity venerated in the esoteric Buddhist traditions. Uh, particularly important in developments of esoteric Buddhism in Japan. The Aizen Myo uh, literally translates as the loved stained wisdom king, sometimes translated as the wisdom king of desire, uh, or also as wisdom king of lust. Um, and often uh, uh, illustrated or depicted in crimson red, uh, it's meant to express passion, desire, lust, uh, and this Buddhist figure is an embodiment of a rather peculiar paradoxical stance seen in esoteric Buddhism, which claims that desire is none other than enlightenment, or bon no soku bodai in Japanese. So according to uh, the Buddhist scripture, the pavilion of the Vajra Peak and all its yogas and yogin sutras, the Buddhist scripture in which this deity is described in detail, uh, the Aizen Myo -o represents the state in which desire uh, which includes sexual uh, excitement, uh, is understood to be another expression um, or none other than the expression of a state of enlightenment. So desire uh, more conventionally is understood within the Buddhist tradition as an impediment that pr uh, prevents one from attaining enlightenment. And so this can be seen as a radically uh, radical reinterpretation um, of passionate love, uh, of courage, and a deep sense of compassion uh, to save all living beings. So this Aizen Myo and this notion of desire as none other than enlightenment can be quite abstract uh, and very specific to kind of a medieval uh, worldview. So today I'd like to address how this deity factors into a very specific historical artifact from medieval Japan to illustrate one way in which this paradoxical understanding of desire and enlightenment was conceptualized and put into practice. 
So uh, what we have here is the Prince Shotoku at age two statue, uh, which dates to about 1292 in Japan, uh, currently housed at the Harvard Art Museum. Thanks to the uh, really wonderful work done by the current curators there, uh, Rachel Saunders uh, and Angela Chang, along with a network of scholars, specialists, and graduate students, research on this statue has advanced significantly in the last few years, culminating in the exhibition at the Harvard Art Museum in 2019, titled Prince Shotoku, The Secrets Within. So who is uh, this Prince Shotoku? Um, so Prince Shotoku, uh, his dates are 574 to 622, uh, is re often referred to the father of Buddhism in Japan. Uh, he's a semi-legendary regent and a politician who came to be known as the great innovator in government administration and for promoting Buddhism in Japan, founding a number of major temples such as Shitennoji and Horyuji, which continue to exist today. He's credi uh, credited for composing the Seven Article Constitution, a, coral of, uh, a code of moral precepts for the ruling class issued in 604 that emphasized Buddhist and Confucian morals and values in governing Japan. He's also credited to have composed uh, some of the earliest commentaries of Buddhist scriptures in Japan as well. So all of this uh, leads to uh, this veneration of this figure as a semi-legendary uh, uh, historical figure. This particular statue, however, depicts um, another kind of miraculous moment, a legendary moment in Prince Shotoku's life when he was two years old, or uh, by a Western count, one years old. So it's a one-year-old uh, toddler. According to this legend, when Prince Shotoku was still a year old, uh, he has uh, suddenly stood up on his two uh, legs, little legs, uh, and taking a several steps forward, uh, placed his hands together and chanted the name of the Buddha, uh, manifesting a relic, uh, bones of the historical Buddha, uh, between his hands. This was an auspicious and miraculous sign of all the great works that Prince Shotoku will continue to do as he matured into a skillful regent uh, and uh, for the emperor. Um, the fascinating aspect of this sculpture is not only in the fine craftsmanship that we see of the body and the captivating facial features of the statue, but what, actually what was uh, discovered inside. Uh, once opened, it was discovered that the cavity of the sculpture was filled with over 70 objects, ranging from precept vows, miniature Buddhist statues, a Buddhist treatise and scripture, relics, talismans, and scraps of paper with personalized poems. While I don't un unfortunately have time to discuss the full contents of what was found inside, it's worth mentioning that the seemingly chaotic inclusion of all of these various forms of Buddhist practice and writing revealed to us the eclectic nature of faith in medieval Japan. Uh, defying some of the neat categories we sometimes try to use to make sense of the past. I think something that uh, Deramut uh, also kind of mentioned in his talk. So within these objects, uh, one of the objects uh, found uh, that raised interesting questions is the placement of the Aizen Myo-o, this uh, wrathful deity of desire, within the ca ca uh, cavity of Prince Shotoku. In fact, not only one, but two objects of the Aizen Myo were found. Uh, you can kind of see the um, size here. And then this is a, a, a circular wooden piece which can be opened up and reveals the deity inside. So the kind of uh, puzzling question is um, that begs to be asked is why was this wrathful deity of desire uh, placed inside the prince of noble virt virtue? So unfortunately, um, there were no inscri inscriptions found on these items or nor were there any documents uh, found within or uh, within the uh, statue that helps to explain uh, some of the intentions of why they were placed inside. So while it's uh, extremely difficult to assess with any certainty uh, what the inter intentions may have been in including these Aizen images into the Prince Shotoku statue today, um, I will uh, first provide an analysis of the uh, statue itself. Uh, and then move outside of the statue uh, to examine some commentaries written about this particular deity uh, around the same time that the statue was um, uh, created in order to try to make some sense of the uh, reason why uh, somebody may have placed the Aizen inside uh, Prince Shotoku. So let me start with a close exa examination of the Aizen Myo'o statue. So here, uh, I think that we first notice uh, that there's a very rough uh, craftsmanship. Uh, it's not a very uh, delicately created um, piece. 
uh, and which makes sense because it was uh, never meant to be uh, shown. It was supposed to be uh, hidden um, and nobody was, uh, you know, was supposed to really see it uh, out in the open. Um, but, and what's interesting is that it does include a lot of uh, the features of Aizenmyo as discussed in the pavilion of Vajra Peak and all, all its yoga, yogas and yogins, uh, the scriptural basis of this figure. Um, so for example, the body color, uh, which is described in the scripture as the rays of the sun, uh, the disc of blazing light, uh, the upward pointing hair, which is uh, described as a wrathful form. Um, and I'm going to move my camera because I'm not seeing uh, my own screen here. The five pronged Vajra and the lion crown on his head, uh, which uh, represents courage. Uh, the third eye of wrath, the left hand of the Vajra bell, uh, and the right hand of the five point, uh, five point mallet. Um, so all of these are uh, listed in uh, detail in the scripture. What is uh, notable is that there are characteristics that are not depicted in this particular um, uh, version. And uh, we can kind of see that when we compare it to another painting of the Aizenmyol, also from uh, the 13th century, uh, which you can consider as perhaps more complete, although I'm not sure if that's the correct way of saying it. So we have the same features that we saw in the literal uh, Aizen statue. And then we have um, all of these other, the, back, uh, the rear arms of this deity, uh, in the left hand, he's holding a lotus flower, which uh, is uh, explained as almost like a hammer that is uh, as, uh, rained down onto uh, those who are ignorant to force them into enlightenment. The right hand and the left hand, which it, uh, holds an arrow and a bow, uh, which is uh, associated with um, building attraction, very similar to the Cupid's bow. Um, and we have the left hand, uh, which uh, is actually holding nothing. It uh, represents a kind of an empty sign. Uh, and this is significant in medieval uh, culture because uh, when the uh, deity was used for subjugation rituals, uh, one example of that is uh, they would, uh, the practitioner would imagine uh, the inner organs of the person that they wanted to subjugate within this hand uh, as a form of subjugation. So uh, I think just by looking at these uh, different implements, you could kind of see the very violent uh, and the uh, aspects uh, of this particular deity. Uh, and when we look at um, scholarship on Aizen Myo, uh, a lot of this uh, has been emphasized about this particular deity, the kind of violent and the sexual uh, nature of this particular figure. Um, and in other words, these missing aspects of Aizen, um, but uh, the question of why is it missing is, is I think an interesting one to pose. Um, and I think you can kind of uh, also say that they all uh, express the, uh, particularly the elements of worldly desires um, uh, that the, uh, the deity is supposed to uh, respond to. So when we compare the two, again, the statue placed inside the cavity of Prince Shotoku seems unfinished or maybe incomplete uh, as the uh, back arms are missing. Uh, the ritual implements that uh, are depicted in the so-called more complete version of the Aizen mural painting. However, rather than uh, seeing this lack of depiction of these certain implements as unfinished, I want to entertain the idea that perhaps the decision to depict Aizenmyo as such uh, may have been a reflection of the internal paradox of desire and enlightenment, and also to suggest that this was a paradox that was also recognized and embraced by Buddhist practitioners in 13th century Japan. So um, uh, other than this particular statue, there's uh, unfortunately nothing else that can help us decode the significance or the meaning of this figure. So we must move outside uh, of the statue and look at the, uh, the texts. So the texts that I will be looking at are uh, commentaries, again, of the scriptural basis for Aizen Myo'o, the pavilion of Vajra Peak and all its yogas and yogins. Uh, there's two particular chapters that I focused on. Uh, chapter four, which is uh, emphasizes, emphasizes the explication on the enlightened mind, the meaning of the enlightened mind. And then chapter five, uh, which is on the Lord of Desire, which includes a very uh, specific description of all of the different uh, implements of uh, this particular deity. So the commentaries are by Jitsun, the Six Secret Teachings of the Yogin Sutra, and Dohan Oral Transmissions of the um, Yoga Sutra. So uh, in these uh, scriptural commentaries, we see that the paradoxical characteristic of Aizenmyo as one who offers both worldly desires, such as subjugations of one's uh, own enemies, of attraction and safe childbirth, 
um, while also simultaneously serving as a representative of the esoteric Buddhist enlightenment, um, was also uh, very consciously uh, addressed together. In other words, the statement desire is none other than enlightenment was understood as a paradox that both needed uh, clarification by medieval thinkers, but also embraced by them. And I'll try to give some examples of, of how this was done. There's a very kind of medieval logic to this, so um, please bear with me here. <laughs> Um, so the first, I think, really interesting thing that we see is uh, an explanation or a commentary on the different uh, physical features of this, uh, of this deity. For example, the left eye is understood as a representative of the womb mandala uh, and the dharmakaya, a specific body of the Buddha's preaching. The right eye is the diamond mandala, which is the sambhogakaya, another uh, form of Buddhist pre uh, Buddha's preaching. Uh, and the middle eye is the siddhi, or the completion. Uh, the Nirmanakaya, the Manifestation Buddha. Um, and so basically the three uh, sections uh, of the womb mandala um, is uh, understood to be represented in the physical features of the uh, of Aizamul's face. On the other hand, the wrathful hair is understood as the activity of subjugation. The five pronged vajra is summoning. Uh, the lion crown is stopping calamities. Five color flower garland is attracting uh, and heavily belts over ears is increasing benefits. And these refer to the various uh, worldly desires that are um, promised through the practice of ritual, um, uh, esoteric Buddhist ritual um, uh, practice. And uh, also refer, uh, according to this commentary, the five section diamond mandala. So we have, um, again, in the actions of the Aizen Myo and the physical features, uh, uh, the embodiment of the two mandalas, which represent um, the entirety of the esoteric Buddhist uh, knowledge. And uh, here are all truths, uh, including all forms of preachings by the Buddha, uh, as well as the various ritual practices that the practitioner can perform to produce worldly benefits, such as subjugation, attraction, and prevention of calamities, are considered to be embedded into the very body uh, of the Aizen Myo'o. This is one example of how the figure of Aizen was conceptualized in medieval Japan, and perhaps a hint of how we can understand its role uh, or imagined role in, in the Prince Shotoku statue. So the text continues with a, an emphasis on the need to maintain a deep sense of compassion and courage, and specifically the necessity to act on behalf of all Buddhas uh, for the salvation of all beings. So rather than uh, emphasizing these kind of uh, the, the violent or sexual aspects of it, the real emphasis that you see in the commentaries is really about compassion. So I'm going to read a very short passage here. Um, so what must be done is to save sentient beings within this lifetime on behalf of all Buddhas. The Buddha, uh, the Bodhi mind or the enlightened mind is none other than knowing oneself as they truly are. And the diamond Bhadra Bodhisattva is the Lord of the Bodhi mind. The blazing light of truth of great awakening and the original quietude is the feature of the enlightened mind. Blazing light also means courage. To observe the nature of the adamantine equality in all sentient beings is to, through one's uh, enlightened mind, observe the equality of all, all beings. This observation of the great compassion, and uh, this is the observation of great compassion in seeing the equality of all beings. Um, in another uh, commentary by Jitsu, uh, he uh, mentions a very similar thing. In accordance to the enlightened mind of Diamond Vajra Bodhisattva and the truth of great awakening, the five rituals, the five rites in the body of Aizen Myo is revealed. It is for this reason that they help all beings in this life on behalf of all the Buddhas. So in, um, what is noteworthy here is while Aizen Myo is often associated with worldly desires and rituals of subjugation, attraction, and preventing uh, calamity, calamities and so forth, um, Aizen Myo uh, is, it has a, uh, there's a strong emphasis on the core Mahayana Buddhist teaching that calls for all followers of Buddhism to dedicate oneself to the salvation of all beings, of universal salvation. The key difference here uh, is, and what makes this a particularly esoteric practice is the claim here that one can act on behalf of the Buddha one can become the Buddha, and that one should do the work of the Buddha here and now uh, in our own kind of physical bodies, rather than to aspire to become a Buddha later in, an, in, a, in a lifetime uh, far, far away. Here it's explained that the understanding of one's own mind as the same of the enlightened mind of the diamond Vajra Bodhisattva reveals Aizen Myo for what it truly is, a blazing light of courage and the ability to see fundamental equality of all beings. 
And this uh, name that keeps coming up, the diamond Vajra of Bodhisattva, uh, here's an example of what this particular deity looks like. And you'll notice that um, when we compare it with uh, the kind of rough eyes and no uh, and the uh, arms in the back that seem to be intentionally unpainted, we see that the emphasis is on these two mudras, uh, which um, uh, resonate with this particular uh, deity and what this deity represents. So it is through the uh, enlightened mind of the diamond Vajra Bodhisattva, which is the realization of the equality of all beings that the practice of rituals for worldly desires associated with Aizam Yoga can be put into practice and assist all beings. So enlightenment as discussed here is not a removal of oneself from the realm of suffering, but rather to act as the Buddha within the realm of suffering with the understanding of the equality of all beings and a deep desire to radically transform oneself to provide salvation for those who need it. The final uh, detail worth pointing to is the fact that um, uh, small lotus, lotus seeds were also discovered within the palms of the two-year-old uh, Prince Shotoku, perhaps uh, meant to express the mir miraculous production of relics based on the legendary account discussed earlier. The miraculous uh, production of these relics could be interpreted as expressing a desire to connect Prince Shotoku's body in Japan to that of Shakyamuni Buddha uh, uh, in, in the far land of India in the distant past. However, in light of the scriptural commentaries of Aizen Myo, the production of these relics can also be read as the generative powers of Prince Shotoku himself. In other words, Prince Shotoku, by generating the fruits of fruit, fruitful seeds of enlightenment to save sentient beings, uh, may have been designed uh, as one who literally embodied the Buddha or acted in place of the Buddha, as the commentary suggested a practitioner of esoteric rites should do uh, when en engaging with practices associated with Aizen Myo. So the scriptural commentaries suggest that the paradoxical position of desire is none other than enlightenment was viewed as a generative force and when embodied would have immense power to assist those in need. And uh, that this uh, paradoxical force was fully embraced uh, as a foundational tenant of esoteric Buddhist practice. Uh, although the statue continues to be shrouded in mystery, I would like to uh, end by suggesting that perhaps this alluring generative force of paradox was one of the reasons why Aizen Yo uh, came to be placed in uh, Prince Jotoku. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for that wonderful talk. Uh, and here's another good one. Uh, I'm happy now to introduce uh, Gil Klein, also of the Department of Theological Studies, who is speaking to us today of the paradox of domesticating demons in rabbinic literature and Jewish incantational bowls, bowls with a plural, bowls. Take it away, Gil. Hello, everyone, and thank you for, uh, to ACTI, thank you to Eric and Anna for organizing this. Part of the reason I um, am presenting this and have written this is because I'm jealous of them and their materials. And so I wanted to venture into uh, the world of the esoteric a little bit and um, came up with this uh, very preliminary paper that I'm going to read from the page so that I don't go over time. Um, why is that not okay go on your way to your home children of night mighty lovers of honor children yet aged under kindly escort you who dwell in the land refrain refrain from inauspicious speech so sing the people of athens in Aeschylus's humanities when they escort the Arrhenius furies to their new abode in the city under the uh, Areopagus, the heel of Ares, god of war. In her attempt to stop the bloodshed in her city, Athena had invited the dreadful deities of vengeance to live in Athens and receive tribute from the citizens in return for, for holding back their wrathful torments. The deities accept and fury moves in. But wasn't Athena's paradoxical solution a bit dangerous? Don't try this at home. 
Those who did try this at home, uh, albeit in different ways and with different demonic beings, were the Jews and Christians of Sasanian Babylonia around the 5th to 6th centuries CE, while their contemporaneous Babylonian rabbis, as represented in the Talmud, frequently regarded magic with disdain, practitioners of magic and their Jewish clients did not hesitate to use rabbinic materials in their appeals to higher powers for blessing and protection. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the Aramaic incantation balls, objects designed to defend the house from the malevolent beings or aggressive magic, which are described in many of the texts written on them as belonging to the general category of amulets, kamea. Uh, these ordinary household earthenware vessels were inscribed mostly on the inside with Aramaic incantations in the Jewish and Mandean dialects, as well as the dialect and script of the Eastern Christian Syriac. The fact that the balls made for these three communities contain almost identical magical formulas angelic, demonic, and divine nomenclatures, and sometimes also drawings of chained demons at the bottom point to a shared body of knowledge, points to a shared body of knowledge. The first collection of balls was unearthed at the end of the 19th century by European archeologists in Nippur, located about 200 kilometers from modern day Baghdad. Um, unfortunately, the archaeologists were more interested in the ancient layers of the city than in the 5th century CE remains and did not record them properly. Uh, subsequent expeditions did not do much to clarify the nature of these objects. We do know, however, that they were placed upside down in the corners of rooms and houses, either above or below the floors. The fact that many balls uh, have since surfaced in the antiquities market, albeit without any provenance, uh, makes their understanding even harder. Nevertheless, in recent decades, scholars have produced extraordinary work on the topic, publishing about a quarter of uh, approximately 2,000 known balls. Three of the unpublished balls are part of our archaeological collection here at LMU. While some of the balls written in Jewish Aramaic do not engage with the rabbinic corpus, many of them quote, adapt, allude to, or indirectly mention stories and rules from rabbinic literature, and especially the Babylonian Talmud. One of the more common ways of enlisting the rabbis in the balls involves various references to mythical events of subjugating demons by powerful past sages. Scholars generally classify this technique under the category of a magical historiola, uh, a magic story that occurs within an incantation serving to illustrate the purpose of the spell and give it an extra air of authority. In this regard, it is not surprising that a large number of balls use the historiola of Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, whom rabbinic literature describes as a late first, early second century CE, pious, sage living in poverty, and dedicating himself to good deeds and Torah study. His piety and holiness have given him the ability to defend himself and others from malevolent beings. For example, the Babylonian Talmud recounts that when called upon to assist with the problem of poisonous snake, Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa stuck his heel in the opening and let the snake bite him. He then showed up at the study house with a dead snake on his shoulder, stating that it is not a snake that kills, but sin. Following this incident, people used to say, woe to the man who encounters a snake, woe to the snake who encounters Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa. But the Hanina story, which the incantations balls are uh, more interested in, has to do, of course, with um, demons. A passage from the Babylonian Talmud reads, one should not go out alone at night, either on the eve of Wednesday or on the eve of the Sabbath, because Agrat, daughter of Mahlat, and 180,000 harmful angels go out, and each of them has his own permission to cause harm. Originally, they would be found outside every day. On one occasion, she came across Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa. She said to him, 
if there uh, if it were not for the fact that there is a proclamation in heaven saying beware of Hanina and his Torah I would put you in danger he said to her if I'm considered so highly in heaven I decree against you that you should never again go through an inhabited place she said to him please give me a little respite and he allowed her to roam about on the eaves of the Sabbath and Wednesday. Although the narratives of the balls are different, it is most probably this story or version of it that is the basis for the incantations historiola. Interestingly, Hanina here does not apply magic to banish the, de the demoness of rot. Rather, he outsmarts her by taking advantage of the secret she has just revealed regarding his status in heaven. Using this discovery, he issues against her a formal decree, gzeira, which is the common legal term for a decision made by a recognized rabbinic authority. The ability to use legal pronouncements against demons and other magically endowed rivals without resorting to magic is not uncommon in rabbinic literature. We will see an echo of it soon in the texts of the balls themselves. For now, it is important to know that Agra, daughter of Mahlat, recognizes Hanina's authority once again and is duly bound by his decree. Here comes the surprising part. The demoness negotiates with the sage about the new terms of her relations with humans. She bargains with him about her sweeping expulsion from human settlements, asking for a little respite. Astoundingly, the rabbi agrees and allows her access to humans on Wednesdays and Saturdays. In fact, the entire passage begins with the warning to avoid the streets at night on these days. The Talmud, in other words, validates the agreement between the demoness and the sage by officially acknowledging it and by issuing a guideline accordingly. Hence, we're left with the question, was Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa reckless with human life? Or did he see evil as part of human life, working to establish the terms of the coexistence? With this, we can finally look at the incantation balls and examine their version of the Hanina ben Dosa story. This historiola appears in multiple balls that mention the sage in more or less the same way. The incantations in which it appears are likewise almost identical in all of the Hanina balls, almost, uh, although the clients are not the same. We do not have time to review the incantation in its entirety, but it is worth noting that it includes an appeal to heaven and an invocation of God's name alongside angels. It identifies the client and the ailment caused by what the balls often call evil spirit, Ruch Habishta. Um, the spirit too is then identified by her name and genealogy. Subsequently, the historiola is cited and the evil spirit is referred to as the one who uh, supposedly met Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, at which point the magical practitioner, who is the speaker, adjures and swears the spirit to be for the client, quote, neither a companion of the night nor a companion of the day, with a threat that God and named angels will destroy and excommunicate her if she does not comply. The incantation ends with biblical verses praising God. It is noteworthy that although the historiola is relatively short, it marks the moment in the incantation when the magical practitioner goes on the offensive. Here is the exact wording of Ball JBA7 here in the green. I adjure and beswear you, you evil spirit who met Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, and Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa said to her, to the evil spirit who met him at that time, the verse that is written, quote, you bring on darkness and it is night when all the beasts of the forests stir. This is Psalms 104.20. As in the Talmudic story, the rabbi in the incantation does not perform magic when encountering the evil spirit. However, instead of issuing a binding decree, the ball has him recite scripture to her. In addition, there is no trace here for the negotiations and concessions of the Talmudic Hanina. Does the ball represent a completely different approach to the subjugation of evil? Not if we look deeper into the verse from Psalms quoted in the incantation. The verse which the ball's Hanina addresses to the evil spirit is in the role of the nocturnal beast, 
elaborates on the theme of Psalm 104, God's complete power over all creation. Verse 19 starts the passage with a praise for God for making the sun and moon, which mark the day and the night. Verses 2021 20, assign to God the bringing of the night, the realm of beasts like lions, when God provides them with prey. But when the sun comes out in verses 22, 23, the lions return to their dens and man, quote, goes out to his work. What we have here then is an orderly division of night and day, predator and prey. God cares for both. He uses time to secure their coexistence. The implication of this passage for the coexistence of good humans and evil spirits is clear. It may be said, therefore, that the Hanina of the balls uses the temporality of night and day to affect a just separation of the two groups. The Hanina of the Talmud uses the temporality of Wednesday, Saturday, and the rest of the week to affect the same separation. In both versions of the story, the goal is to give the demonic a fair share of home. Another holy man uh, invoked in the Aramaic incantations through a historiola is Joshua Baltrachia, a high-ranking Pharisee described in rabbinic literature as living around the end of the second century BCE. He is a peculiar choice for incantation balls. The rabbis mention him only briefly without the title rabbi and with no concession, uh, connections to magic or miracle. A fascinating account in the Babylonian Talmud makes him the teacher of Jesus, no less, despite, despite the impossible chronology. He lived a hundred years, supposedly, before Jesus. Don't ask. Joshua Baalprachia's name appears in a large number of balls that use the conceptual, ritual, and documentary components of two known Jewish rituals, the ban or excommunication, and the deed of divorce known as get, which is still used today in similar format in rabbinic courts. The incantations in these bowls frequently target the demoness Lilith, the famous temptress, who is normally associated with issues of sex, fertility, and childbirth, and who has in this particular magical tradition, both male and female manifestations. The general collection of balls contains a variety of anti-Lilith incantations, as well as multiple drawings of the demoness in shackles. In the balls mentioning the get, the magical practitioner offers a separation between his client and Lilith or other demons by reenacting a mythical, mythical act of exorcistic divorce, supposedly issued by Joshua by Baltrachia. The original story on which this historiola is based is not found in any of our known sources, rabbinic or otherwise. The incantation ball, um, the incantation in ball JB814, for example, which also contains an image of a bound horned demon, starts with, quote, I cast a lot and take it. And, and a magical act I perform, which was in the court session of Rabbi Joshua Baalpachia. I write to you, male lily and female lily, a deed of divorce, a deed of release and dismissal, just as demons write deeds of divorce and give them to their wives, and they do not come back onto them in order that you should take your deed of divorce and your document of divorce from Shilai, son of Gushnaz Duch, and from Nanai, his wife. Immediately after this opening statement comes an invocation of divine power capable of breaking, quote, demons, afflictions, and devs, and affliction demons, and satans, and no good ones, and liliths, end of quote. The concluding uh, statement of the incantation, which reproduces almost verbatim the language of the traditional Jewish get, returns to the deed of divorce and to Joshua Baalprachia. For I release you by a document of divorce and a letter of dismissal and a deed of release according to the law of demons and devs and according to the law of the daughters of Israel. Much has been written about the theme of divorce in the balls. While some have minimized the role of the magical practitioner, 
more recent work has emphasized the aspect of ritual performance implied in the text. The fact that the legal procedure of the get in rabbinic law is valid only if the deed is personally handed to and accepted by the woman being divorced and if she is fully identified by her parents' names, hence the concern with demonic parentage, um, strongly suggests an active involvement of the practitioner and perhaps also the family in activating the balls. Others have argued that the balls were not understood to be in themselves deeds of divorce. Rather, the historiola allows for the incantation to assimilate the demons of the present to those of the past, so that by the time of the ball, they will have already been handed a get by no other than Joshua Bar Prachia. Um, so, but I do not see any of uh, these two possibilities as necessarily mutually exclusive. Uh, but in any case, the questions arising from the act of divorcing evil through a procedure common to both demonic and Jewish spouses stand regardless. Do these two groups truly have the same judiciary? Is demonic possession a kind of interdimensional cross-cultural marriage? Can there be a divorce without a wedding? Scholars of the incantation balls have already considered these questions, comment, commenting on the paradoxical aspect of the divorce theme. Uh, Shaul Shaked, James Nathan Ford, and Sian Byra write, quote, the fact that demons are capable of being divorced implied that their presence in the household is recognized in some way as legitimate, if undesirable attachment. In order to be able to drive them away under the guise of proper legal proceedings, they are implicitly given a status that does not normally apply to them. The demon is seemingly accorded a respectable human status, that of a concert. The divorce formula would simultaneously achieve two conflicting aims. It will, would legitimate the demon by retroactively recognizing its quasi-married status and at the same time outlaw it by annulling that status. The divorce theme underlies the ambiguity of demonic presence in human society. The demons are beyond human reach and can, and yet they form a kind of invisible part of society." End quote. To this perspective, perceptive formulation, we may add that the divorce theme is not the only one in which demons and humans are understood to be parts of the same society as is apparent in the case of Hanina Bendosa. What is however missing in this formulation as well as the, uh, the treatment of, ball, of the balls by many other scholars is the material and symbolic complexity of the ritual objects themselves. Most scholars seem to take for granted the assumption that the balls were simply apotropaic devices like the mezuzah, tefillin or amulets worn on the body. While some balls clearly functioned as repellents of evil beings, most did not. Instead, they aimed to disarm demons by trapping them inside the houses they haunted. If a recent suggestion to see the origins of the balls and the practice of trapping scorpions and other poisonous reptiles under such vessels is correct, the choice of the more fragile concave structure over a flat surface, typically used for amulets or curse tablets, was meant to create a space for the bound demon. This would also imply that the position of the balls in the house was over the floors rather than underneath them, a possibility which is supported by a drawing of what appears to be a room with four balls in the corners on top of the floors, as you see in this ball. Perhaps it is indeed better to keep evil where you can see it. This paradoxical idea that the expulsion of demons was the inclusion of demons was so counterintuitive for some scholars that they wrestled to find alternative solutions for this phenomenon. Um, nevertheless, it is becoming more and more apparent that paradox is better equipped to account for the mechanisms of the balls. It is fitting, therefore, to end by returning to Athens and envision the incantation balls as hills, the hill of, of, the, of Ares, perhaps, underneath which the Furies were housed in the middle of the city. Or better still, to return to Greek, 
for which exorcism, exorcismos, from ex, out of, and orchiesin, beswear, would become, in this case, esotericism, from esotericos, that which is inner or within. Thank you. You'll forgive me if I jump in to remind us to keep our friends close and our enemies closer. Paradoxically, which I hate to say in this group of quite friendly people, some of whom are actually friends. Thank you so much. Oh, that was just wonderful. And I wonder if it doesn't tell something about marriage in addition to spouses, demons, but what a fascinating paper for so many reasons. What a beautiful session. Uh, let me open uh, things up to the group and ask for, for questions for those who just presented. Thanks again to the three of you so much. Don't be shy, we're probably among friends. Well, then I might jump in. Uh, but first, actually, let me give an opportunity for the speakers to jump in. Uh, please, uh, Dave, Eric, Gill, if uh, if there's something you'd like to add or or address to 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 each other, by all means. Uh, uh, Diermut, he's he's preempting you, Eric. You'll come later, maybe. Um, I apologize for jumping in at an no. time. Uh, I wanted to ask Eric a, a question about his presentation. Um, I've recently been reading some translations of uh, Tibetan tantras, which are, you know, I cannot attest to how uh, accurate the translations are. Many of these tantras are referring to um, kind of hybrid bon uh, Buddhist practices that are very, very similar to what you just outlined. Uh, to the to the actual fact that it, there are actually, uh, as you as I'm sure you're aware, meditations in Tibetan Buddhism which are designed to um, open up uh, certain channels and wind channels that are based on this kind of uh, issue. I've always wondered how is it that there is such an overlap, or do you have any feeling about this between these practices that we see in Tibet and then that we see in Japan, and do you think that there is a kind of a core context to this, or do you think that the Japanese cultural context has kind of um, you know, taken over that particular uh, Tibetan influence or any kind of Tibetan influence that may be there. Well, th uh, thank you, Dermot, for, for the question. I think, um, yeah, the, the similarities are, are quite striking in a lot of ways. And I think maybe um, the, the main reason for that is I think not all of the texts are, are uh, the same, but uh, there are a number of key uh, texts, for example, the Mahavirochana Sutra, um, uh, you know, that um, are uh, both read in kind of the Tibetan um, Buddhist context and that were transmitted to, uh, to China and then eventually Japan. Um, so I think a lot of the shared um, uh, rituals and um, the issues uh, that are uh, stem, I think, from uh, the, the fact that they're kind of reading the same text. What I find uh, quite interesting about Japan, um, and I know much more about the Japanese context than uh, Tibetan, but um, I think that um, uh, particularly in, in kind of the issue with Aizen Mio too, from the, really the, the very beginning, I think there's this really uh, strong recognition. And I think it has something to do with um, the Confucian ideals uh, that um, the, it, it, the, that kind of paradoxical uh, element of the violence um, is really kind of taken seriously and negotiated, I think, in, in really interesting ways in Japan, where um, on the one hand, yes, they recognize this kind of power of, of subjugation and, and whatnot, but then they're also trying to really hard to, to frame it within kind of the Mahayana um, ideal of, of the salvation of, um, uh, of all, all, all beings. So I think um, uh, a quick question, a uh, quick answer would be they're sharing a lot of the text, but I think there are uh, uh, interesting divergences in the way that they're reading the text as well. Um, Asuka, I see that you have your hand up. And then Gil, after Asuka. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all for the wonderful presentations. I wanted to ask Professor David Kovacs uh, a question, or rather, I, I'll, I'll be curious to hear how you're going to resolve this sacramental paradox, because 
While I was listening to your presentation, I thought about uh, the, the problem or the question about the real presence, which is very important in religious studies. So we in religious studies have our own responses. So I thought about like temporary ritual suspension of realism, like in the ritual context, or aesthetic effective turn that many scholars have been talking these days. But then I thought about the four commitments of Jackie and I just don't think Jackie is gonna be happy with any of the solutions that we can provide for Jackie. So I would be curious to hear from you like exactly how you're going to solve this. Yeah, good. Um... So I, I am sympathetic to uh, movements in religious studies that, that want to re-emphasize what the Eucharist does over what it is, that kind of distinction, um, which would allow us to, to bypass the kind of realist question altogether, right? What does, what does bread and wine do that it doesn't do now, but the body of Christ does? And there, I think what it does is it's life giving, but it's a new life, right? And I think it's not for nothing that um, it's our most base biological power, our digestive system, the one, the one biological capacity shared by every living thing, whereby we kill the Eucharist that's put into us and it comes, it's resurrected as a new life. Uh, the life of Christ must now be our lives. Uh, but trying to spell that out in a way that doesn't just get reduced to a metaphor or something poetic, that's, that's the barrier I am up against. Um, I, I'm, 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 I'm starting to become sympathetic towards um, theories of uh, not transubstantiation, but trans um, signification. Um, what is it that that um, the meaning of these things have changed? That Christ's body has a meaning that flesh and blood doesn't have. But I'm only starting to play with those theories. I'm open to any suggestions here, anything that anyone's read or any ideas that people have. I'll see you in the hall with some ideas for now uh, from your period, frankly. Uh, but different sorts of texts than, than you guys read in philosophy department. For now, Gil Klein. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, my question is to Eric, um, and this is a, a really extraordinary, I think, uh, analysis of uh, the notion of desire through the statue and you showed us that uh, based on textual evidence, we can explain um, in a way retroactively so somewhat uh, the statue, but does it work the other way around as well? Does the statue change tradition or does the, do uh, material objects participate in form forming the tradition in the same way or does it go back and forth? Uh, thank you. That's a really excellent question. And um, and I actually gave a, a similar presentation um, in front of a, a different audience in Japanese and got some very good uh, feedback from people working on material culture and sculptures. And uh, the fascinating uh, insight that I had was that there are other um, examples of Buddhist sculptures that uh, very intentionally use different uh, wood uh, and uh, intentionally make it a little bit rough than other uh, places to, to uh, increase a certain uh, power that's associated with that particular um, uh, statue. Um, so that's, uh, uh, so I think that's uh, kind of what you're, you're referring to, that, uh, that there's a limitation in, in um, looking at things just from text to materials, but what is the material, uh, uh, how does the material uh, change the way that um, these deities are, are uh, actually put into practice? And I think um, that's a, a, a part of this project that I actually haven't had a chance to look into, but uh, it's, uh, I think it's, it's just, um, uh, I'm really excited to look into, into that aspect because I think it's, it's uh, um, uh, definitely would um, uh, uh, deepen uh, the uh, analysis. Um, so thank you for that, that question. Well, we are rolling in to our 12.35, we've rolled into our 12.35 lunch break. We're gonna reconvene 
at 105, I'll leave you with something on my mind uh, on the basis of these several talks. Our body and desire themselves paradoxical and how do they relate to spouses and demons? And how do the, la the last two perhaps relate to each other? In any case, lots of food for thought as we go eat stuff and make it part of us. Okay, see you at 105. It's really been a delightful morning. Look forward to seeing you in the afternoon. The, uh, the time has come, it is 105. So I'd like to start our uh, third session for today um, and uh, titled Paradox, Desire, and Wonder. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'd like to uh, quickly remind everyone that we, uh, unfortunately we don't have uh, that much time to give full bios of all of our speakers, but uh, the uh, internet, uh, sorry, the link to the speaker bios and event schedules are in the uh, comments or the chat, so please uh, feel free to take a look at it there. Um, and so we'll proceed with each speaker giving a 20 minute presentation followed by a 10 minute Q&A after all the speakers have presented their work. Uh, again, feel free to send in questions in the chat uh, and then we'll open up for a discussion um, uh, through the uh, raise hand uh, icon uh, during the Q&A. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn things over to our first speaker, Father Frank uh, Stephen Coronu, a graduate student in the MA uh, program in the Theological Studies Department uh, here at LMU. Uh, his presentation is titled, Is Earthly Desire Paradoxical? Uh, Bernard or Clairvaux on Loving God, Part 1. Thank you so much, Eric. And hi, everyone. I'm so happy to see you and to have all of you present for this presentation. My paper explores the notion of desire in Bernard's on loving God to ask whether Bernard presents the experience of desire in this world as paradoxical. For this paper, I mean by desire, I mean by paradox a figure of speech that seems contradictory yet compelling upon further examination. Bernard of Clairvaux, 1090 to 1153, the author of Unloving God is a 12th century Cistercian abbot that is a head of a monastic household from Northeastern France. He is an abbot with unparalleled influence on the religious culture of the latter Middle Ages. Bernard is also a teacher, a prolific writer, a mystic, a lover of the church, a mover and shaker in ecclesial politics of his era. Bernard on an occasion sees himself as a paradox when he referred to himself as a chimera, quote, a monstrous hybrid, a monk who has taken the vow of stability and is ever at a distance from the contemplative life of the monastery, unquote. As a monk and an abbot, Bernard thought the central task of the monastic life was to provide a context for cultivating a desire for heaven. Disciplining desire was part of the monastic endeavor. The treatise on loving God, addressed to a general monastic audience, provides some insight into Bernard's understanding of the sort of desire he wished to ingrain in the monks in his charge and to the larger monastic culture. I hold that desire is at the core of Bernard's treatise on loving God and of his thought more broadly, and that earthly desire is paradoxical, at least on these six counts, as you can see from the screen. First paradox, desire is capable of moving in opposite directions, both of leading the soul to God and dragging it away from God. Second paradox, Desire for God is satisfied, yet that desire for God never ceases. Third paradox, true love must desire nothing for the self, yet God who is true love desires to be loved and makes everything for himself. The fourth paradox, the human person who loves truly ought not desire reward, but true love ought to be rewarded. The fifth paradox, in desiring God, we have already found God, but in this very finding, there is still desire to find. 
We desire to find, while at the same time, we find to desire. And finally, Bernard Hose in the Six Paradox that our effort to find God is rather God's effort to make himself available to us. For it is God who seeks to be found. But even in God's effort to make himself available to us, our effort to seek God is indispensable. Desire, that longing love, is at the core of the treatise on loving God. In this world, desire is alive in both the one asking and the one answering, the self and God. In the very first sentence of his treatise, Bernard declares his personal desire in these words, quote, Bernard called Abbot of Clairvaux, wishes that he may live for the Lord and die in the Lord, unquote. Bernard then moves on to talk about the desire of Emeric, Cardinal Deacon of the Church of Rome, who sets the whole treatise into motion, quote, you wish to hear from me why and how God ought to be loved, unquote. And Bernard is glad because this desire is spiritual and not worldly. Quote, I am glad that you are asking for spiritual in return for worldly gifts, unquote. Bernard sees desire as innate. He holds, quote, an inborn sense of justice cries out that we ought to love God with all our power, for we know we owe him everything, unquote. Bernard highlights the inherent goodness in desiring and knows that in desiring, we seek what we consider to be the highest, the best, the finest, and so direct our energies toward it. The inherent goodness in desiring is not surprising since our desire for God is animated by God. Quote, God is the cause of loving God for he is both the efficient and the final cause. He himself provides the occasion. He himself creates the longing. He himself fulfills the desire. He himself causes himself to be such that he should be loved. For Bernard, desire is from God and is a longing love. Our inborn sense of desire is however capable of moving in two directions. Because God gave humanity the power to will freely. Though innate desire cries out that the human person desires and loves God with all his power, Bernard points out the difficulty that the human pe person faces. For, quote, he is tempted to treat what has been given as his own and clench it to himself, unquote. Though the power to will freely, rightly conceived, is to will God by giving up one's will wholly to God and not rather to will things for oneself, the human person uses this power to will things for himself. And this makes desire capable of moving in opposite directions. We can both desire God and not desire him. This makes desire paradoxical. It both draws us toward and away from God. But desire that seeks satisfaction in the self and in the created things is never satisfied, according to Bernard. It is never satisfied, quote, because the highest and the best is not to be found in any of these deceptive delights of the world, unquote. Bernard therefore considers it extreme madness to chase after things, quote, which cannot only never satisfy but cannot even blunt the appetite, and which is always restlessly sighing after what is missing, unquote. It only makes us linger pathetically in a twisted path. Quote, runs along winding roads, walk round in this circle, unquote, never finding the satisfaction we seek. It is worthy of note that Bernard differentiates between this twisted desire and the desire to satisfy the basic needs of the body, needs necessary for human sustenance. He even maintains that it is, quote, unavoidable that, we desire and, that our desire and love should begin with the body, unquote. 
It is the inordinate desire for gratification and too much self-love, which causes the person to seek satisfaction, quote, out of proportion and headstrong, unquote, that Bernard considers twisted desire. Delineating further on desire, Bernard holds that were life not to be short and strength insufficient so that the human person could experience all the worst pleasures, he or she would, quote, realize how unsatisfying they all are, and this would turn his desire to God, who alone satisfies, unquote. The just person, especially the monk, through knowledge of the vanity and the weariness involved, avoids the twisted and winding road, choosing instead, quote, the royal road and turns neither to right nor to left, unquote. Our desire can be satisfied only by God, about whom Bernard writes, quote, he satisfies your desire with good things. He causes you to desire, and he himself satisfies your desire. Bernard holds, therefore, that desire can be satisfied, but introduces another paradox of desire when he writes that memory with God, memory of God is sweet for those who long for God's presence. Quote, it does not satisfy their longing, but intensifies it. He who eats me will hunger for more, and who is fed by God says, I shall be satisfied at the sight of your glory, unquote. It seems clear that Bernard holds both, that desire for God is satisfied in mystical encounter, and that that desire for God never ceases, but will remain forever. Indeed, enjoyment for God only intensifies the longing for God on this earth. This for me is paradoxical. And for Bernard who frequently talks about the mutual desire between God and the person using the image of bridegroom, that is Christ or God, and bride, the longing monk or Bernard himself, it is not only the bride who desires the bridegroom, but also Christ the bridegroom who desires his longing bride, attracted by her desire for him, just as she is also attracted by his desire for her. Christ not only desires to be incarnated and live among us, but also Bernard writes with ly typical lyricism. Christ takes such pleasure in her that he comes often and willingly to the chamber of the heart in which he finds desire for him stored, unquote. This is noteworthy because Bernard earlier on insists that, quote, divine love is true love, for it is the love of one who wants nothing for himself, unquote, and yet insists also that God wishes us to desire him and that God responds to our desire for him with greater expressions of his desire for us. Bernard expresses this when he holds that quote, God is the cause of loving God. He himself provides the occasion. He himself creates the longing. He himself causes himself to be such that he should be loved. He hopes to be so happily loved that no one will love him in vain, unquote. Bernard in addition knows, quote, scripture says that God made everything for himself, unquote. For Bernard, God's gift of creation and offer of salvation makes this desire of God a just demand or desire. True love must desire nothing for the self. Yet God, who is true love, desires to be loved and makes everything for himself. But how can God make everything for himself and Bernard still hold that divine love as true love wants nothing for himself? Bernard thinks both are true and he relays another paradox of God's desire for us. Bernard also writes evocatively of the bride's love sickness, the longing monk, Bernard himself, wounded by the sword of Christ's love and sick with love, quote, desires that Christ, her bridegroom, should visit her more often, unquote. And here Bernard has in mind the encounter with God in the sacraments, which sometimes seem to mean for Bernard what we might call mystical encounter. Such encounter with God leads the faithful to despise everything else 
everything which will get in the way of God's desire. But having considered this longing love for God, who is the reward of the bride, Bernard also calls on the human person to have true love for God and neighbor, and does seek nothing for himself or herself. Having conceived of true love or charity as basically the love of one who wants nothing for himself, and also, quote, the love that keeps nothing for itself, unquote, Bernard went on to maintain that true charity cannot be empty. He holds that though true love does not seek its own benefit or profit, true love cannot be empty. Thus, although true love does not seek reward, it deserves it. Bernard holds that only the soul who does not seek reward receives a reward. Bernard opines, therefore, that reward is both intrinsic and extrinsic to true love, which ought not desire reward, but which nonetheless ought to be rewarded. In loving and desiring God, therefore, is a conscious human person not implicitly desiring a reward? Here again, one encounters a paradox of desire, which is intrinsically and extrinsically linked with love and reward. The complexity of paradox of Bernard's notion of desire is further heightened when Bernard addressing God writes, quote, no one can seek you who has not already found you. You therefore seek to be found so that you may be sought for and sought so that you may be found. You can be sought and found, but not forestalled, unquote. Bernard seems to maintain that in desiring God on earth, we have already found God, but in this very finding, there is still a desire to find. We desire to find, while at the same time, we find to desire. And not only this, but our effort to find God is rather God's effort to make himself available to us, for it is God who seeks to be found. But even in God's effort to make himself available to us, our effort to seek God is indispensable. What a complex net of paradoxes. Little wonder Bernard refers to this complexity as the most wonderful thing. I conclude that desire is a complex phenomenon in Bernard's unloving God. It is an activity of the soul, innate to humanity. Desire is intrinsic to love and is alive here on earth. God, as well as the human person desires, and their respective desires are equally paradoxical. Six areas of paradox of earthly desire highlighted in this paper are desire is capable of moving in opposite directions, capable of leading the soul to God and also dragging it from God. Desire for God is satisfied, yet that desire for God never ceases. True love must desire nothing for the self, Yet God, who is true love, desires to be loved and makes everything for himself. The fourth paradox, the human person who loves truly ought not desire reward, but true love ought to be rewarded. Five, in desiring God, we have already found God. But in this very finding, there is still desire to find. We desire to find while at the same time we find to desire. Our effort to find God is rather God's effort to make himself available to us. For it is God who seeks to be found, but even in, the, even in God's effort to make himself available to us, our effort to seek God is indispensable. Desire is paradoxical, but what is paramount for Bernard is the cultivation of right desire and the ability to discipline desire so as to desire God. We do this by giving up our will totally to God knowing that God alone satisfies our desires. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Father Frank. That was uh, a really wonderful uh, reflection on uh, the real relationship between God and the human individual uh, and uh, really fascinating uh, presentation. Um, so I would like to uh, go to our next, up next is Professor Anna Harrison uh, in the Theological Studies Department uh, and really the mastermind behind today's symposium. Um, the title of her talk is 
uh, The Paradox of Celestial Desire, Bernard of Clairvaux on Loving God, part two. Well, I'm very happy to be part two to Frank's part one. It's my honor. And I quickly just say I'm dedicating this paper uh, to a woman filled with desire, Patricia Soledad. As Frank has taught us, we are for Bernard primarily who or what and how we desire. Frank has shown that animating Bernard's treatise on loving God is a notion of desire as response to God's come hither summons, which stirs the appetite, causing it to hunger for fulfillment. Bernard's, Bernard also indicts desire for luring the self into a search for satisfaction it cannot find among created beings and which therefore distracts from loving God. Bernard elaborates a disciplining of desire through love of neighbor that obliges us to reckon with our own longings. This love involves sharing what we have with the other, which whips up the fear that we may not have enough for ourselves. And this fear to Bernard may be productive because it has the potential to stimulate a reliance on God to supply for what we're afraid we might lack. Exactly this fostered dependency results in frequent experiences of God's kind interventions in our daily lives, Bernard promises. And through such experiences, we will come to quote, taste how sweet the Lord is, close quote. This tasting becomes a longing, a yearning for greater pleasure and more extensive contact. Today, I take up where Frank left off to examine Bernard's notion of longing love in heaven. I point to three paradoxes that emerge in this context. I then offer three suggestions about why the paradoxical holds such appeal for Bernard. First, to Bernard, our lifetime desire for God will find satisfaction in heaven, the very experience of which is loving union with God that is forgetful of self. But only once the self becomes herself can she forget herself. Let me explain. In Bernard's thinking, love joins the lover with the beloved and the true lover, training full attention on the beloved is entirely forgetful of self. But as Bernard insists, we can't forget ourselves until we become our complete self and souls in heaven long for this completeness, which is to Bernard a longing of the soul for the body from whom death has separated her. Pining with frustrated longing for her flesh, the soul cannot fully direct her desire to God. Thus the presence of the body on earth, both a help and a hindrance to approaching God is in heaven prerequisite for assimilation to God. Souls in the celestial spheres, Bernard writes, quote, want their bodies back, close quote. And they await the general resurrection when, as medieval Christians taught, each soul would be reunited with the body that belonged to her in this life. Only once the reunion of body and soul takes place is the person completely who she is. And only when she is fully herself can she relinquish herself in the self-forgetful desiring love that concentrates exclusively on God. A second paradox. Assimilation of self to God in eternity means that God and the human being both are and are not one. After body and soul are united, we direct our love entirely to God and Bernard insists the love by which we love God is God himself, and it is us. One of Bernard's preferred biblical phrases is, God is love. And because God is love, when we repay him for his gift of love, which to Bernard is our creation and the opportunity for our salvation, when we repay him, we're returning to him what he has given us, his very self. And what we return to God is our very self, 
for, as I have mentioned, uh, who we are is who and how we love. Moreover, as Bernard relates, becoming the love that we, that we give, our will conforms to God's will. And so we love as he loves. Thus, as Bernard writes, in heaven, our human will will be changed into divine love and we will become like God. In this context, Bernard writes of the self in heaven disappearing into God, like a drop of water disappears into wine, becoming indistinguishable from it. And Bernard says that the self remains itself for all eternity. Quoting scripture, Bernard proclaims that God cannot be all in all if anything of the human being remains in the human being, and he immediately asserts that the substance of the person endures forever. Thus to Bernard, eternity is home to a reality marvelous beyond our comprehension in which we really do change while remaining ourselves and in which each of us does and does not become God. Bernard will finally not let go of the Tunis he trumpets, God and self, but neither does he wholly concede the otherness to each other of God and the self that is saved. There's a third paragraph, uh, sorry, third paradox associated with Bernard's heaven, where fulfillment of the soul's desire for God is not an abandonment of desire, but a fanning of the very desire it fulfills. Human beings in the bliss of eternity experience utter satisfaction and they desire ceaselessly. Theirs is a longing love that carries with it no sense of absence. This is to Bernard a restful desire that is a love on fire and which Bernard writes straining under the force of paradox is like a sober intoxication. It's evident that love cannot be separated from desire for Bernard, that satisfaction involves the very longing. Bernard thus hints at a continuity between our experiences in this life, which are characterized by desire, and the next life where a desire is an eternal play. And there may be another aspect of continuity between the life to come and the here and now if we take seriously Bernard's claim that God can only be sought if he is found. As Frank has observed, to Bernard, we already have what we desire, if only we were aware of it. It is thus almost as if the longing itself were what mattered to Bernard, as if heaven were awareness of what already is. Thus, Bernard pulls much of earth into heaven, including desire and the body, and both are paradoxical. Each helps and each hinders us in recognizing God's nearness to us. As I hope to have illustrated together with Frank, Bernard's rhetoric often takes us to the very center of reality, to God and self, and making a bold declaration about this subject, he immediately offers what seems to be its opposite allowing the contrasting claims to bump up against each other, not resolving in favor of one of the other. Let me now make three suggestions about what, why Bernard does so. First, I think that Bernard uses para, uh, paradox to highlight God's unknowability. Bernard wants to destabilize basic assumptions and patterns of thought. He employs paradox as a bulwark against pride for medieval Christians, the root sin from which all others spring. And he does so by keeping at bay what he calls curiosity, which Bernard conceives of as the intellect uncoupled from love in pursuit of knowledge. Paradox throws into relief the limitations of reason confounding any effort to securely grasp at reality, visible and invisible. Although for centuries monks regarded curiosity as a central vice, Bernard was especially zealous in underscoring its dangers. His anxiety fueled perhaps by an emerging institution for the study of theology, the schools, 
attached to urban churches, which were proliferating during Bernard's lifetime and which were displacing the monastery as the primary centers for innovative intellectual work. In schools, priests, not nuns, not monks, were students and teachers. And their quest for wisdom was divorced from the carefully cultivated desire of the monastery. In accentuating paradox, Bernard is alerting a wide readership to the importance of linking love and learning. Bernard was a player in virtually every major intellectual and, and institutional controversy that rocked the 12th century church, acquiring fierce friendships in the process and making scores of enemies. Among his chief foes was a teacher in the schools named Abelard, a brilliant firebrand, some of whose writings Bernard denounced as heretical and against whom Bernard helped to secure the condemnation of a church council and a pope. Abelard composed a number of texts for classroom use, including Sic et Non, which means yes and no, in which he raises 158 theological questions, such as, is it ever permissible to lie or not? Can our sins please God or not? Is God seen to be present in everything or not? Raising these questions, Abelard then lays side by side apparently contradictory answers to the questions in the form of quotations from the Bible and from church authorities. In his preface to Sic et Non, Abelard elaborated principles that students should follow to reconcile these apparently contradictory statements. Thus, for example, Abelard urged students to notice that a single word may have multiple meanings, to pay attention to the intention with which an authority made a pronouncement, to identify corruptions in the transmission of texts and false attributions of scholarship. Abelard offered these and additional rules confident in the mind's ability, using the right analytical tools, to reconcile claims and to reach a correct answer to the question he poses, yes or no. Such questioning. Abelard declared, sharpens the mind and is the first step toward truth. Abelard's confidence that the challenge of Sic et Non would produce harmonious findings is one display among many of his fearless optimism about the mind's ability to explore the interior self as well as to plumb the depths of the divine, a mark of the intellectual freedom and daring for which 12th century Western Europe is renowned. Bernard is, of course, in some sense, similar to Abelard. He also accentuates contradiction, as we have seen. Unlike Abelard, however, Bernard does not look forward to a future resolution of the contraries he lays before us. Centuries of scholarship have celebrated Ab uh, Abelard as a harbinger of the scholastic movement, the movement associated with urban schools in which, to some thinking, integrated reason into theological thought. Many have considered that in contrast with Abelard, Bernard was incapable of feats of reconciliation because he was not armed with the newly honed tools of dialectic and logic on which Abelard depended. I contend on the other hand, that Bernard deliberately rejects attempts at reconciliation of the sort that preoccupied Abelard. And indeed that Bernard uses his rhetorical skill to throw a wrench into the effort. Whether Bernard's contentious relationship with Abelard, with the schools, more with, with the schools and with Abelard more specifically, fueled Bernard's paradoxical thinking are questions for another time. Let me offer a second reason to account for the place of paradox in Bernard's thought, which is connected to his larger devotional program and geared not simply to confound prideful curiosity, but to promote humility and to evoke wonder. In Bernard's hands, paradox pulls at the reader, instilling in him a kind of yearning for resolution that Bernard knows will not be forthcoming, a desire that he wishes to drive nonetheless. 
In virtually all of his writings, Bernard is primarily interested in provoking the experience he wishes his monks to undergo. When Bernard makes what seems to be incompatible claims about God and self and celestial bliss, he does so to stimulate wonder, which different from curiosity is a sense of awe at a reality about which we can learn, but which we cannot colonize because although it is not an irrational reality, it is far other than we, what we may suppose and resists all attempts at subjugation to reason. Recognition of this contributes to the humility that Bernard wants to instill in us. And it simultaneously provokes our longing to know God, a love reality that promises inconceivable pleasures. Thus, Bernard's very sense of rationality is different from Abelard's, and this difference may be some of what is at stake in the contrast between monk and scholastic. Abelard's reason is logic-driven and univocal, barreling toward conclusions in which this or that, but not this and that, is the case. Abelard employs instruments of reason that are extrinsic to the reality they claim to get at. In contrast, Bernard's reason is infused with the love reality it seeks. It is at home in proceeding by way of imagery and by way of dialogue between differing ideas that tends toward open-endedness, not conclusion. It's a way of reasoning in which one does not want to solve the paradox, but to remain within the paradox. This brings me to my third and final point about Bernard's pension for paradox. Bernard wants to linger in the paradox because to him reality is paradoxical. Bernard sees paradox everywhere as we too are starting to do. Um, more obviously, Bernard contemplates Christ, the mighty God who is a vulnerable baby. Mary, a creature who gives birth to her creator. God's life-giving death and our salvation, wholly reliant on our own effort and entirely dependent on God. More than this, paradox is at the very center of the universe. For God is love. Love has its own law and the law of love is itself paradoxical. God gives his love to us freely, but demands repayment. The highest of all, love is made one with all. God is the most gentle of lovers and the most violent. God is love and love triumphs over God himself. There you go. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harrison. That was a really uh, a wonderful presentation and really uh, I, I love how the part one and part two really uh, blends together. Uh, and and uh, in uh, keeping uh, in, in lieu of the interdisciplinary aspect of this uh, particular symposium, we have a, a, a treat for with our free, uh, next um, uh, presenter uh, who uh, will talk about uh, paradox in it from a more po poetic uh, perspective. Um, so the uh, our next uh, presenter is uh, Sarah Mackley uh, from the English department, uh, and the title of her uh, presentation today is Presence Through Absence, A Poetry of Paradox. Thank you, Eric and Anna and uh, Emmy Lou and Acti. It's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm going to jump right in. It was autumn. There had been fog and food, good conversation. And I was sitting in a train, not facing ahead, but backward, watching the landscape and seascape retreat as I paged through my precious cargo, a book, also moving backward toward the front of the book from the middle, which seemed for some reason in this moment right. In this way, I entered the world of Inger Christensen a liminal realm, in this liminal realm, a realm of transit moving towards some unseen future, looking inexorably back, looking into the near past, the past as it fell in its permanent swaths and fled. In another autumn, 
I could still remember how this felt, how I had been carried to a place so deeply interior that I can still locate its exact emotional space or the one it opened in me. And it's attached to a cigarette, an outdoor spot like a park and a relationship hinged to a sense of disconnection, subtext, something about to dissolve or to open or something that had changed or that had to be hidden, something important, complicated, or something burgeoning before definition, something in need of protection, a moment told almost entirely in its glances and snippets, as though the camera had been trained away from the normal focal point, the script from narrative, from backstory, no headshots, please, but gesture, all the ephemera of a moment. Subplot, extras, yes. Shot, perhaps, from the view of the feet. Embrace of chance, object as souvenir, the smallest things. Into the trap door of opening, of closing, of change. Seen in sidelong glances from the corners of the eyes. And as I open the book again and find my way to the middle and move backwards toward the front, that same feeling, it's right there. As though this book is a vault for this feeling, containing at least in its center, mostly space. These poems are elliptical in this section of grass translated by Susanna Need to the point of being almost terse, yet without that feeling. They open rather than tighten. And it's not message we'll find as much as extreme lyric concision. All that is distilled, withheld, unspoken in the first half of this book, balanced by the loosened, unfettered cascades of the last, as though all that was inner will move into X, expulsion, exhale, the explicit thought bound quickly as in a flood to whatever dislodged boot is scooting by. But here, distillation pulls us into the shock of encounter where so much is implication to intimacy below the level of speech. By the road choosing acceptable knolls for a short cigarette break, talking of birch's leaves, because it is birches we see, birches with fluttering leaves along the white trunks, talking of other birches with naked trunks, talking of years, the space between us, maybe it's empty, Seeing a group of children come up, hearing them ask the way, saying yes and seeing them run, embarrassed and smiling, run in the right direction, crushing the cigarettes glow in the sand where they ran, trying to go on ourselves between us. The focus is on the verbs, choosing, talking, seeing, hearing, saying, crushing, trying, on what is being done, on the doing. There's a little short story here, one that seems so casual and yet perhaps heartbreaking. The climax of crushing held well away from melodrama because after all, they are just putting out their cigarettes, but also the momentarily allowed if deflected glow or perhaps its absence. Do the cigarettes carry the glow no longer in the maybe empty space between us? One could write great gusts about symbol and metonymy here, of course, but the thing is that it's the absolutely casual and quotidian and understated seeming normalcy of the moment, at least as it could be observed from the outside, say, in a medium shot or a long, as well as the restraint of the two smokers that give us this line, this moment, its power. 
on the way to those precarious last ones, moving the whole poem in two simple words between us into another zone, another room of rhetoric, into the interstitial where much of the unuttered and internal action of the poem is occurring all along. And even while the figures of the poem must talk politely, presumably cannot touch, the knolls must be acceptable and only the birch trunks can be naked. Still, there is no I or you in this poem, only us. The remembered snippets of moment told quickly in fragments as though the speaker is referencing postcards all begin with actions and only imply their subjects. But in all cases, they are plural. The adults always in second person, even the children are plural. And why embarrassed? Embarrassed to speak to adults or embarrassed and smiling because they sense something unspoken between them that they do not yet have words for. And perhaps after all, the adults don't either. The pronouns speak to nothing, if not togetherness. And yet this adult togetherness feels fragile. It's just a cigarette break and it's not. A tonally gentler poem by Jean Valentine even all night long, pulls us into an even more radical interiority, occupying ever more elliptical turf, its nocturnal center radiating out into universal invitation as individual ego shrinks to the size of the same needle that pulls me in my dream, blurring the boundaries between singular and collective experience even all night long while the night train pulls me on in my dream like a needle, even then down in my bed, my hand across the sheet, anyone's hand, my face, anyone's face are held and kissed, the water, the child, the friend, unlost. What also blurs in a wonder of indeterminacy and syntactical ambiguity is location. Is the speaker on a train at night or in bed or in a sleeper car? Is the train a dream location or an actual location in which this dream of touch and healing occurs? The order in which these early images and phrases comes to us and the suspension of both these imagistic fragments and the rules of punctuation allow us to float in the space of the poem on the page as well as in the fluidities of its love eye and identities. GPS won't help us here. Connective tissue feels hollowed out and yet it is possible to convert the poem into one long horizontal sentence, just fill in the punctuation, add an and, and you'll have a firmer meaning. But that would kill off the very experience of the poem. Having to dangle more vertically with the slumbering speaker into these deeper and deeper waters where the solidity of earthly boundaries is likely to dissolve and having to wait as the moment by moment images float up from the depths, are they gifts or are they clues? Like one after another petal of rest and restoration and relief is what allows us below any logos based understanding to feel the suffusion of joy and the surprise and depth and mystery of it that pull the poem into being as it sows its way across all forms of loss and separation. And it feels generous ultimately, as well as proportionally right somehow that the images and categories are not overly particularized. Night, train, dream, needle, bed, hand, face, sheet, kiss, water, child, friend, they operate like primary colors 
to which we'll add our own nuances of shading, growing increasingly abstract by the end, but enough of them are concrete enough to establish an immediately accessible, if mysterious and mutable and mutating scenario, one that allows the last word of the poem, unlost, to reverberate upward into all we have touched. As in many of Tronstrom's poems, the movement here in Valentine's is line to line, moment to moment, notational, gestural, this, then this, then this. We are let into the motion of the mind, to its pacing, the pacing of epiphanies, of turns as they occur, or as a rock would skip its lake, here and here and here as though we're allowed to witness, as it happens, the activity of noticing just that, as it happens, with its slight correctives, its widenings of perception in the next moment and the next, and this feeling of being allowed in, into the being in the process of becoming is magnified by Valentine's embrace of indeterminacy, so essential to the way this poem in all ways moves. It's instructive here in particular to consider both the sense in which indeterminacy implies many possible solutions and this sub-definition of indeterminate, which so mimics the way this poem emerges, characterized by growth in which the main stem continues to elongate indefinitely without being limited by a terminal inflorescence. A poet's function, do not be startled by this remark, says Valerie, is not to experience the poetic state. That is a private affair. His function is to create it in others. Some poems like these get under our skin because something is missing. It takes a little work to put them together. The omissions at work here do not subtract emotion, but in a funny way, trust it so much that there's no need to announce it, as though the idea is to engage it and let it inform the piece, but as an engine below what emerges in the text. Oddly, this places a poem even closer to, rather than further from, the emotion of a moment by allowing us to linger on what was actually perceived or remembered in a certain state. And because there's no need to abstract or even narrow the emotion by naming it. Other poems ask to be taken as similes for the thing they're getting at, but refuse to give us directly the other side of the simile, which creates more space and mystery, throws us into the midst of their embodiment of an experience rather than leaving us on the clever outside of it. In other words, in comparing one thing to another without bothering us, bothering to tell us the name of one of the things being linked, a simile is implied rather than stated explicitly. The conscious use of omission forces us into our own sense of association, our own questions, our own discovery of what, in fact, the other side of the comparison might be, or more to the point, might feel like. Sometimes a word can't come near the thing it would normally stand in for. In order to have a more direct experience, sometimes the name of its general category must be stripped delinked, removed. The name is like a lid on a pot of boiling water, keeping all the steam inside. It can't begin to imagine the true heat and power rumbling beneath. And what if the other side of a simile is the ineffable, the very thing that defies being named? Perhaps we can only hope to approach expressing it by an act of extended comparison as in Ralph Angel's poem, Subliminal Birds. 
Metaphor, says Valerie, marks in its naive principle a groping, a hesitation between several different expressions of one thought, an explosive incapacity that surpasses the necessary and sufficient capacity. Once one has gone over and made the thought rigorously precise, restricted it to a single object, then the metaphor will be effaced and prose will reappear. Groping of this sort is at the heart of this poem's operations as it hovers over the moment when we feel a charge in the air before we can know why and celebrates this shift in consciousness, this heightened awareness in all its phenomenological specificity, whatever it results in, whatever it becomes without its repeated gesture of groping for comparison. This poem is already an exaltation, simultaneously wary and ecstatic, but it is the hinge of like that pulls at the phenomena of the world, that insists that all these are examples of the thing that the hinge is connected to, the thing that remains unnamed. Subliminal birds. Like the infant, wriggling free, tasting air, hollering from the blue cliffs of Echo Park. Like clear wind, like ashes rising from the tips of leaves or wooden storefronts in the must of towering construction. And all that occurs while waiting or forgetting the sound of a train in the heart's distance. All that coming and going, so much life spreading its wings in both worlds, soaring beneath the crust of the handshake and signature, between the lines of stories we tell, in order to be heard here, in order to feel confidently at home. Right here, where walls of survival are windows, a whole galaxy of stars in the nod of the proprietor of a carnival shooting gallery, where ecstatically with blinds drawn, a woman tumbles from her bed into the swirling green waters of an oriental carpet, where children, school kids in gray and white uniforms twirl until the buildings are dust on the parched lips of a storm, a shimmering ribbon, an indelible radiant haze. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. McLeod. That was very beautiful. Um, and uh, I think that that uh, concludes our three presentations. And um, so I would like to uh, open it up for uh, any questions. I thought it was really wonderful in the way that all three um, presentations were really uh, focused on, um, you know, what is what does it mean to attempt to uh, express the ineffable or the unnamed, right? Uh, and I think that's uh, something that I would be interested in having um, everyone kind of address. Um, but I do see uh, Aska Sango, uh, 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 Dr. Sango, uh, please go ahead. Thank you for the wonderful panel. So um, thought provoking. Um, I, I do have a question for Professor Harrison, whose presentation um, I thought had so many commonalities, points of comparison with mine. Um, and I'm yearning for resolution like Barnard. <laughs> I wanted to hear you say more about the difference between, in Barnard's view, curiosity, prideful curiosity and yearning for resolution. Is it a difference in nature or in motivation or in attitude or in goals or exactly how those two things are different in Barnard's views? Um, I suppose in all those ways, I think that he would uh, associate curiosity with an absence of properly, uh, he would say, ordered desire. 
or curiosity would be the use of, you might say, the intellect, uh, as I said in the paper, uncoupled with the love uh, that uh, uncoupled from a love that is to him properly directed. And so he would say that unless you are, um, in fact, that it's, it, it, the, the, the humble approach and the uh, necessary approach, frankly, if you're going to hold on to a hope for heaven, is in to, to hold back um, uh, dimensions of the intellect until uh, some significant progress has been made in the monastic life. I think the primary purpose of which is to Bernard to, culti to, to cultivate uh, desire under a disciplinary regime. Uh, you know, the, and then we have a particular rule that monks follow. We have, uh, I mean, for, for the monks on whom Frank and I work, um, uh, there's a commitment to, to, to stability and to obedience and to orienting your life in a particular way uh, within a communal context that exactly is meant to help you discipline your desire. And you have to make some sort of substantial progress in that movement before you can, I would say, uh, uh, turn on uh, your intellect without enormous fear that it might go in a prideful direction, which would simply, well, it doesn't simply mean anything. But I think for, Bern I, I don't know if I'm even beginning to answer your question. Wonder, however, I think is the mind on fire with a mm -hmm. loving longing to know more about what to Bernard is both um, the Tr triggering the wonder and calling it. Uh, but anyway, let me, let me, um, maybe Sarah will do a better job. But that's <laughs> a beginning, Asuka. Curiosity is a horrible sin for Bernard. It's a primary sin. There's a text he writes called On the Steps of Humility and Pride. Pride is the root sin. I mean, that's very common in the Western European monastic tradition. And what, what pride uh, generates as a sort of first step away from God is curiosity, which is the mind moving unconnected to love, whereas they should move, you know, in unison. Because for him, love is, it's not that it's not rational. It's not that it's irrational, which is more than rational, but it is rational. Uh, it's not irrational. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I think we have an, another question from uh, from Gil. Yeah, thank you um, to three of you for wonderful papers. I have a question that I think um, starts with an observation somewhere in between uh, Anna and Sarah's papers um, that I think are very uh, similar in the sense that they talk about words, about the inability uh, or, or the use of words in different, in different formats or methods. Uh, and it seems like there is this um, division between the rhetorical dimension of, wor of words uh, or descriptive and the poetic, maybe the magical, maybe the mystical, mm -hmm. uh, somewhere between prayer and politics, right? This kind of, um, and so I, and I do see that you're both talking about situations that are not political. I mean, Bernard is, is a monk, he's, he's involved in politics. Mm. But he, his motive is not, and his his um, the way of thinking is, yeah. is not geared towards that. Um, I am reminded of uh, a, a few centuries before uh, Bernard. The um, Lim has written about Gregory of Nazianzus in the time of the council in uh, Constantinople where everybody in the city is engaged in talking about theology, right? You go, you buy a, br a piece of bread and people talk to you about the nature of God uh, and, and, and you can't get away from it. And he's upset, he's a theologian, 
but he's upset that everybody is talking about it's, bec it's becoming almost entertainment or it's becoming uh, a show. And so there's a very strong political dimension here of who has the authority over the, wor the word, who has the authority over truth. Um, and so th the poet and the monk are in, in, in this sense very much alike, but um, but what about the rhetorician? What about the wor worldly dimension of both of these? Um, I think that uh, Sarah, you, you pointed out the, the experience, the way that the poem can create a reality, um, but is it a political reality or is it a sensual private reality? Is it a reality with others? Um, there is that, there are the two cigarettes and what's <laughs> between them. But, um, but we, I, so I don't know, I'm just raising this, this question of the political that I think. Um, so can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, there's that, that old saying, the personal is political and the political is personal. So, you know, on some level, I think this is in the eye of the, the beholder or the listener, however that translates to you. Um, a lot of what I find really interesting and fascinating in terms of trying to figure out what can make a poem feel alive and transporting rather than stuck like something you would stick on a shelf is how do we, how do we get to that freshness of experience? And to quote Valerie again, uh, one of my favorite lines of his is see, seeing is forgetting the name of the thing one sees. So, you know, um, I don't know if that answers your question at all, but I just wanted to acknowledge that my investigation was first in that area. And yeah. however it applies outside, I think, you know, it, it's up to you, it's up to others. Thank you. So, I mean, I know there's a big political contest, there may be political contests of all sorts, especially I might say in the 12th century where there's an enormous amount at stake in terms of the rising power of the priesthood different from the power of the monks. And the priest is now said to assume unprecedented power, which remains his today. Frank, I know you don't have quite the sort of power I'm speaking about, but you'll excuse me. Um, so there's enormous power conflicts of all sorts going on in Bernard's discussion, for example, of curiosity versus wonder. I mean, he, he is, I think he has to be almost implicitly indicting, not so much the priesthood, but the scholars who are necessarily in some sense priests, uh, who are clearly not monks. And so, you know, part of the background has to do with more, you might say, obviously political structures or structures that have exercised for century political powers. Those are, those are shifting as they always do. But again, with the rise of the clerical class in the 12th century, by the way, associated with a kind of emerging understanding of the Eucharist that David talk, talked about, which makes them the people to make God present in the room, which is an astonishing uh, ability. Um, there's all sorts of political stuff at play. One of the things that's interesting is Bernard is very interested in a lot of the topics I took up today when he writes a treatise to the most politically powerful person now, you might argue, uh, in the Western European context, and that's the Pope, whose power is also rising dramatically at this time. And anyway, he gives him lots of advice uh, that draws on some of the paradoxes that I've uh, mentioned today. That does not by any means address your question, except oh, it does. It does. I'm just saying, I, mean, I think that this is exactly what I had in mind in the sense that the, the paradox, keeping the paradox also gives power to certain people that's well that's for sure that's a great insight 
Well, uh, if we're on the, the topic of power, I'm going to use my power as moderator to <laughs> insert my own question. Um, so I, I thought the uh, one of the, the kind of themes that I, I saw in all three is, is this notion of tension, I think, uh, you know, in Father Frank's, uh, um, you know, the tension between the relationship between God and the individual, the tension of desire um, and this longing, and then also the tension um, that was discussed in, in expressing, right, uh, one's, one's uh, self. And so I was wondering, um, you know, especially this kind of the soul as being uh, divided from from God and the body, and this this, uh, this and, and how do we kind of deal with with this tension, right? Uh, and it seems to me that is it even possible to remove the tension, uh, or is tension a part of the the reality itself? And if that's the case, uh, must we embrace the tension? Is that the kind of key? Right. Um, and I, I kind of pose that as a question because I think maybe that's one way to think about the uh, in the esoteric Buddhist tradition that desire is equal to enlightenment. That's one way of completely embracing uh, the tension. So, um, so just kind of thinking about uh, embrace uh, and tension and paradox, uh, I just wanted to kind of open uh, that up to see if uh, any of uh, the speakers uh, wanted to um, uh, kind of add to that uh, particular thing. Um, I just wanted to say, um, Anna, I loved your your whole movement toward the idea of embracing paradox and living within it, yeah. uh, rather than trying to to fight against it. It reminds me of John Keats' embrace of what he called negative capability, um, which is to try to exist in that a place of un unknowing, yeah. without you know grasping after facts and logic. Um, it's, it's a place that reminds me of something about, uh, you know, Buddhist practice as well. But um, I think there's a lot to learn from trying to relax into that place, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and certain things can open up in that consciousness that um, escape, uh, escape us when we're centered in other parts of the mind. Wonderful. Um, well, I think uh, we're all kind of learning how to cultivate our own openness as uh, to embrace as we can listen to all of these presentations. And I do realize that we're out of time at the moment. So uh, thank you again for uh, another three uh, set of really wonderful presentations. Um, and we're going to take uh, yet another very short break uh, and we'll uh, reconvene again at 2.20 uh, in which we will have our keynote um, uh, speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Askasango. Um, and so I'm very looking, I'm much very looking forward to that, uh, but feel free to turn off your videos for about five minutes and we'll see you, see you uh, soon. Um, good afternoon. It's so nice to be spending this full day with you, even if it's on Zoom. Uh, it's been a real pleasure, but things are about to get even more exciting uh, because we have a beautiful talk coming to us now. I am so happy to introduce uh, Asuka Sango, Associate Professor of Religion at Carleton College, who specializes in pre-modern Buddhism. Professor Sango's first book is The Halo of the Golden Light, Imperial Authority and Buddhist Ritual in Hayen, Japan. This is a study of Buddhist stagecraft. Her current book project examines practices of learning in medieval Japanese Buddhism, and it breaks new ground exactly in part because it looks at behind the scenes evidence. So rather than focusing on the uh, intellectual giants of the period and place, uh, she looks at notes, lecture scripts, debate records, and such produced by what she calls ordinary monks. Uh, so uh, that just sounds absolutely marvelous. Today, uh, Professor Sango is going to speak with us or to us, and then we'll talk with her about Buddhist debate in medieval Japan, its epistemic paradox and soteriological possibility. And so it's my pleasure now to welcome, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Sango. So good to have you with us. Thank you so much, Professor Harrison, for that kind introduction. 
And thank you to you, but also uh, Professor Eric Swanson for um, extending the invitation to me and organizing this wonderful conference. And thank you also to uh, ACTI and Theological Studies for your generous support. So today I'll be talking to you about Buddhist debate or rongi in medieval Japan while addressing its sociological and epistemological paradoxes. But before I start, I wanted to comment on the image used to publicize this symposium. I just sent you um, the link to the landing page of the symposium so you can take a look at the image again, although you were seeing it uh, during the break. So this 13th century image is connected with the first soteriological paradox I talk about today. You see here a bloody hell, five demons of hell seated in front of the three cutting boards, cooking, eating, blood on the ground. Demons are drawn a little bigger than these white beings, which are monks, they're naked. Other than their shaved heads, they're stripped off of their identity markers. The demons are dissecting the monks' bodies, holding knives and chopsticks, placing the meat, the monks' meat, in small bowls. It's both shocking and paradoxical to learn that monks can fall to hell. So I'll let you chew on that a little bit as I start sharing screen and start my presentation. All right, so. That was um, Hell of Dissections. That was the image that you were seeing from the pictorial skull of Monk's Hell. And it was inspired by the source text of this uh, image. Uh, it was Ho uh, Mondo Ho Shamon Kyo included in Busetsu Butsumyo Kyo. And now I want to talk about another one of these 32 monks held. Oh, so this source text talks about the 32 hells that are reserved specifically for Buddhist monks. So I want to turn now to the next hell, the hell that I want to focus on um, today. Here is the narrative description of this hell taken from the contemporary source, the 13th century collection of Buddhist narrative tales, Shasekshu, or Sand and Pebbles, compiled by the monk Muju. It goes, there was a scholar monk in Nara. After his death, his disciple wondered where he had been reborn. One day, the disciple met his teacher. It all felt like a dream. The teacher said, let me show you where it has been reborn. Thereupon, the teacher led him into a temple that looked like Kohokuji temple. In the lecture hall, monks dressed in Buddhist robes were participating in a debate, longi, just as they do in the world of the living. Then from the sky fell iron pots, scoops, sake cups, and finally demons of hell. The demons scooped the molten iron from the pots, poured it into the sake cups, and passed them to the monks. The monks drank from them, fainted in agony, and died while their bodies were burned to ashes. And after an hour or so, the monks came back to life. What kind of hell is depicted here? It's debate hell. This is the hell for us scholars. A debate in pre-modern Japan, longi, was one of the central scholarly practices of Buddhist scholar monks. It was an exegetical exercise where two monks, or sometimes more than two monks, exchanged a question and answer regarding interpretations of a quotation from Buddhist canonical text. You see here that the author Muju depicts a hell where scholars engage in debate just as they did while they were alive, but this time as an eternal Sisyphean punishment. So what is so soteriologically damning about the practice of debate according to Muju? One can answer this question from two different perspectives, social and philosophical. First, social. The author Muju used the story of debate hell to criticize what he saw as a problem of or corruption about the elite monastic society of his time. At that time in Japan, there were many public debates sponsored by the state. They were hierarchically organized, forming a path, a single path of monastic promotion, culminating in one's promotion to the central ecclesiastic office of the state called Sogo office. Scholar monks started with debates within their own temples, like graduate student conferences. Then, then they moved on to the examination debate, which is like the first national conference you attend as a young scholar. 
After that, there was a series of more public debates to pass, quote unquote, before they were promoted to the Sogo office. Later in the story of the debate hell by Muju, the scholar monk who fell into the debate hell explained why he fell into this hell. I have fallen into this endless suffering because I studied Buddhist teachings seeking fame and profit. Here he's saying that he participated in these public debates while competing with other monks because he sought fame and profit. And that's why he fell into the debate hell. This is not exactly Barnard's curiosity and wonder dichotomy, but definitely Muju's um, criticizing politically motivated scholarly knowledge, prioritizing religious knowledge. We'll come back to this point a little later. So Muju was using this story as a criticism of the polit politicization of debate and how that promoted fame and profit. In short, Muju is saying, wrong motivation, wrong goal. Scholarly learning should be motivated by one's desire for liberation. This is understandable because Muju was not an elite monk and he refused to or could not participate in these public debates. Here is his minority report criticizing the elite center from a marginal location in the monastic society of the 13th century Japan. However, Muji wrote many more stories criticizing scholar monks in which he not only claimed that scholarly knowledge in application promotes fame and profit, but also he argued that scholarly, scholarly knowledge um, is to be, scholarly knowledge, excuse me, to be attained through scholarly exercises like debates is inherently wrong or inferior compared to other forms of Buddhist practices such as the observance of precepts or meditation. Muju represents a soteriological approach to scholarly knowledge and debates. In his view, scholarly knowledge is not religious knowledge because religious knowledge must lead you to liberation. Next, I would like to put Muju in conversation with those whom he criticized scholar monks themselves. We are focusing on two of them, Joke and Sosho, roughly Muju's contemporaries. Like I said earlier, if Muju was speaking from the margin of the monastic society, these two monks belong to the center of the monastic society, occupying prominent places in the main Buddhist temples of the time, such as Kofukuji and Todaiji. Let's start with Joke. A monk of Hosso school, a prolific author, a renowned scholar of his time. He shared his views about the issue of a monk seeking fame and profit through debates. Here's what he said in his Gume Hoshinshu. Even scholar monks can condescend, envy, belittle, and slander others. And as a result, despite their aspiration to study Buddhism, they waste the unsurpassable treasure of Dharma and seek more reward of fame. It is as if they were licking the precious medicine of nectar only to exacerbate the sickness of affliction. Here, Jokne points out that just like lay people, monks are subject to their desire for self-promotion. So they may have the right motivation, but they can be subject to the problem of fame and profit just like anybody else. This makes a big contrast with Muju's moralizing tone. While Muju admonished monks for their moral failure, Joke admitted their limitation despite their status as monks. In Joke's view, a solution is exactly this, as described in the title of this text, realizing gume as um, foolish and delusion of oneself, realizing this leads to hoshin, giving rise to an aspiration for liberation. Um, so it's said in the title of the book, Gume Hoshinshu. So Joke agrees with Muju that debate promotes fame and profit and monks are subject to that problem. But he did not address the second question in scholarly knowledge inherently wrong or inferior. For this, let's turn to another elite scholar monks 
monk Sosho, a 13th century scholar monk of Todaiji, even more prolific than Joke, and an accomplished scholar who participated in a series of state-sponsored debates and got promoted to the Sogo office and many other important positions in the monastic society of his time. Despite his scholarly achievements and his extremely successful career as a scholar monk, Sosho's reputation among us, among modern scholars of Buddhism, is not good, mainly because of this text he wrote that we're going to look at together now. It's called Kindan Akuji Gonju Zen Konsei Josho. It's a collection of vows written by Sosho in his 30s and 40s to refrain from evils and practice good, as said in the title. Modern scholars have tended to read this text as evidence that proves the validity of the kind of criticism that monastic, of the monastic society that Muju and his like-minded contemporary authors put forward. So here are the main concerns expressed in Sosho's Kindan Akuji. We don't have time to talk about all of them, but you get a sense of sort of a large scale moral debauchery happening in a monastic society of Sosho's time just by looking at this list, the list of things that he confessed to. So the first two items are the things that Sosho is encouraging, uh, scholarly activities and the life of reclusion, and the rest uh, are the things that Sosho is prohibiting. Uh, prohibiting the drinking of sake, the consumption of vegetables with strong smell, sexual indulgence, inappropriate speech, the games of Igo Shogi Sugoroku, which were probably played for the purpose of gambling, um, and stealing. So today we're gonna focus on obviously, number one, scholarly activities. About this, Sosho said, even if I studied the sacred teachings of Buddhism for the purpose of gaining fame and profit, I must always transfer the merit produced by my study for the purpose of achieving the supreme enlightenment. Here he's admitting that Muju's right, that his motivation for studying Buddhist doctrines and participating in debates is at least partly his desire for fame, fame and profit. But he does think that the karmic merits of scholarly learning can be can direct him to the right path. Also, Sosho explained his ultimate goal in Buddhism, in studying and practicing Buddhism, including debates, by repeatedly using this expression, ege, understanding based on wisdom, which is a short for ege datsu, or liberation from cognitive hindrances, which is to be contrasted in Buddhism with shinge datsu, or liberation from effective, deeper affliction. This is because of the Buddhist view of views or Buddhist view of intellectual knowledge, including scholarly knowledge. In Buddhism in general, views are not neutral. As the famous scholar of Buddhism, Rupert Gethin once said, views are included in the Buddhist stock list of, quote, stock list of four kinds of attachment. Within Buddhism, there's a range of views regarding views. One position is found in the Pali literature, early Indian Buddhist literature, especially in its discussion of the Four Noble Truth. Wrong views are hindrances to nirvana, and conversely, gaining the right views is key to nirvana. Another position may be found in the famous Majamaka school of Buddhism that all views are false. Any cognitive formations are false, and we need to eliminate them altogether to achieve nirvana. And Eric Swanson, Professor Eric Swanson earlier talked about the radical reinterpretation of this idea of Buddhist liberation, Buddhist path uh, in esoteric Buddhism. But I'm talking about something that esoteric Buddhists challenged. Now, similar view in, it's found in the Abhidharma and Yogacara systems of Buddhist path in which views are a means to make progress in the Buddhist path, but ultimately cognitive function needs to be extinguished. So Sosho was familiar with this view of the Buddhist path when he repeatedly talked about liberation from cognitive hindrances as a goal of his scholarly learning. He was thinking of scholarly learning as a necessary means to get to the liberation from cognitive hindrances, which in turn is a necessary step to get to the liberation from effective affliction, 
But this also means that the scholarly learning alone is not sufficient in achieving liberation. So here's bad news for us scholars. Scholarly knowledge has a limitation. This also, I think, uh, may present an interesting point of comparison with Professor Harrison talked about in terms of Barnard's humility uh, and his criticism of curiosity. Um, so to sum up what we've discussed so far, both Joke and Sosho, these elite scholar monks, agree with Muju about the reality of debates where scholar monks were motivated by their desire for fame and profit. However, Sosho did not necessarily agree with Muju that scholarly learning is inherently wrong. Sosho agrees that scholarly knowledge alone is not enough, but he disagrees that it's inherently wrong or necessarily inferior. Rather, social is pointing us to a soteriological paradox inherent in the traditional structure of the Buddhist path, where scholarly learning is a necessary step, and yet it ultimately needs to be overcome to achieve the perfect liberation. So that was a lot, but now I want to shift gears and think more about religious knowledge what that means, how we talk about religious knowledge and how these medieval authors that I'm talking about today approach this question of what is religious knowledge. In Muju's view, religious knowledge must be conducive to liberation, which I would call a soteriological approach in thinking about religious knowledge. However, for the reminder of our time, we want to take an epistemological approach by asking this question. What is the nature of knowledge produced through the practices of scholarly learning such as debate? What sorts of epistemological assumptions can we find in debates? Assumptions regarding what creates and validates knowledge. Here, my conversation partners have been religious studies scholars such as Jose Cavazon, Paul Griffith, and Jay-Z Smith. In short, my answer is that it's commentarial. This is a problem in that it goes against the nature of our own scholarly life, from applying for jobs and grants to navigating a tenure review process in your academia, a scholar is expected to create original knowledge instead of simply memorizing or commenting on the words of the past intellectual giants. As Jose Cabazon pointed out in his study of Indo-Tibetan Buddhist scholasticism, Buddhist scholasticism, or scholasticism in general, was, quote, ultimately unconcerned with questions of originality, end quote. However, in the modern mind is accustomed to, quote, equating vitality with novelty, and therefore our tendency in encountering a tradition that seems relatively unconcerned with questions of originality and creativity is to consider it to be stagnant or worse yet dead. However, J.G. Smith argues, commentarial knowledge is fundamental to religion. He said, quote, if there is anything that is distinctive about religion as a human activity, it is a matter of degree rather kind, but what might be described as the extremity of its enterprise for exegetical totalization. In other words, Smith thinks that commentarial knowledge, commenting on the established canonical texts, this exegetical engagement with the past, with the tradition, is fundamental to any religions, both pre-modern and modern. And this is what ensures, according to Smith, the sacred persistence, which is a provocative claim, and you may not agree, but I can certainly see how this is true in the in medieval Japan. And I want to demonstrate this point by showing you the language of debate. There are many different formats of debate, but here's one common format called lecture and question format. A debate starts with the questioner raising a question regarding a quotation from canonical Buddhist text. Here, the task of the questioner is to find a quotation for which contradictory canonical interpretations exist, because otherwise there's nothing to debate. Then the lecture master responds, and that's the first round of debate. 
So here you see what I meant when I said a debate is ultimately an exegetical exercise. Now I want us to focus on the second round follow-up discussion. Here, the questioner can proceed in two different ways. 2A and 2B mean that the questioner will simply ask the follow-up question and the questioner can throw in an additional quotation. 2C is a radically different approach where the questioner points out that with regard to the controversial quotation quoted at the beginning, both ways are acceptable. So this is the opposite of what Professor Collins talked about earlier as the principle of excluded middle. This means that there are two different exegetical approaches in Buddhist debate in Japan, and both are equally viable. Etsu is reconciling an apparent contradiction because canon must be self-consistent. Ryoyo means both ways, so not reconciling, these are two very different approaches to um, the canonical sacred text. And these two approaches, Etsu and Ryoyo, reflect different types of engagement with sacred text that Smith illuminated. The impetus for closure and limitation on the one hand, and the impetus for application and expansion on the other. According to Smith, it's not despite, but precisely, quote, because of the presupposition of canonical completeness that an interpreter needs to develop exegetical procedures that will allow the canon to be applied without alternation, or at least without admitting to alteration, end quote. This is the paradoxical nature of exegetical totalization, as Smith puts it continually extending the exegetical limit of the closed canon without altering the canon in the process. Whereas Etsu reconciling work to maintain the internal consistency of a closed canon, Ryoyo both ways allow the coexistence of different interpretations as re irreconcilable and yet acceptable. With this in mind, I would like to conclude. Today, by studying Buddhist debate in medieval Japan together, we have found that in the Buddhist view of the path, in the Buddhist view of views, esotriological and epistemological paradoxes are intertwined. On the one hand, you will find a dichotomy between right views and wrong views, where gaining the right views and gaining the understanding based on wisdom then becomes the goal of the practice of scholarly learning, such as debate. On the other hand, there's another perspective that radically relativizes the right view approach by saying that all views are false and cognitive function needs to be terminated altogether to achieve the perfect liberation. This was reflected in the two different exegetical approaches found in the language of debate, etsu and ryoyo, reconciling or not reconciling. If our reading is correct in considering the second attitude, yo-yo, or both ways, as relativizing of knowledge or scholarly knowledge, can a paradox still be relevant? Bagger, whose book I understand is one of the inspirations for this conference, defines paradox as this. Paradox is an apparently absurd claim, a claim that apparently entails a self-contradiction, either formally, materially, or performatively to which one feels at least some inclination to assent because it's supported by at least one form of epistemic authority that one recognizes. But what do we do when a paradox is encouraged as in the attitude of Ryoyo both ways in debate? What would Bagger say about the intellectual and religious tradition of Buddhist debate where an epistemological paradox is encouraged as a sociological approach, can a paradox still be re relevant? And I'm thinking that the answer may be yes, but I'm also reflecting on what uh, Eric Swanson, Professor Eric Swanson said earlier about embracing the tension and paradox um, and all of the presentations that I listened to today. And I thought that it would be fun to discuss this question with you. And I'd love to hear what you think.
So I would leave you with this question as I end my talk. Thank you so much for listening. Well, thank you so much for talking and giving us the opportunity to listen to such a wonderful presentation. Uh, we're so grateful to you for coming to us all the way from Carleton College. Uh, I see a number of hands raised, so I'm going to be quiet. And um, I did see first, uh, Eric, did you have your hand up or were you applauding? I didn't. I was applauding, but I could have too. <laughs> Well, I, I suggest, should we, should we take up the offer first? Oh, Gil, you have your hand up, I think. Yes, but if, if you want to do something else, then I can wait with this. It's not. No, but I was going to say, should we take up the offer to talk about the relevance of paradox or lack of and the, the matter of tension to which uh, Oscar pointed? But we can do that, but we can also respond to your, I'm sure Oscar will be happy to respond to your question first. Okay, so thank you so much for this. This is extraordinary, uh, not the least because I find so many parallels with my own material. And I'm very curious um, to think about this with you. Um, and this has already been um, extraordinary in the sense that um, there are these two possible ways of thinking. And so the paradox is partly uh, a tool uh, in Etsu, right? But it's also a paradox between these two modes of interpretation. Um, and if I understand correctly, the, the uh, Etsu uh, mode is more exegetical. That's what, uh, if that's what you're arguing. And saying that because um, for the ancient rabbis, uh, they are uh, insistent that um, all views are correct. In fact, debate, which is the core of rabbinic activity, that's what they do. They almost sanctify debate to the highest level. Uh, and so debate, even when God interferes, and he does, they say, stay out of it. And he, there's actually a pretty clear um, story where they say, Torah is not in heaven. I'm sorry, you gave it to us. Now it's our job to figure it out. Uh, and God admits, okay, you defeated me in debate, right? And so, uh, and there are also many statements that God says, um, about different disagreements. These and these are the words of the living God, this famous statement. And so the idea is that um, the both ways, the Ryoyo is already in the level of reality, on the level of truth, of divine truth. Divine truth is divided or double or paradoxical. Um, and so here, um, that's basically my question, not so much in terms of um, prescriptive uh, aspect, what you, should you do as a Buddhist, as a Buddhist scholar, but in terms of the ontology uh, of the matter. Yeah, that's thank you so much. Wow, I, I just, I was so busy just writing everything down. This is so wonderful. Um, so where should I start? Uh, that was such a great comment. So I, I think I agree that traditionally we tend to associate um, Etsu type of approach to sacred text, which is to reconcile an apparent contradiction so can we can maintain the canonical consistency, right? That's, we tend to think of that as the proper exegetical approach. However, uh, both the debate texts that I read but also religious study scholars such as J.G. Smith suggest that in fact, the religious engagement with canonical texts would go both ways, open or closed. So canon is closed, but in your job as, as an exeget, 
or interpreter of this tradition, you have to open it up in terms of application, but you can't change the canon. So you're just kind of going back and forth, right? Between these poles where you can't change the canon, but you have to open it up. So that is maybe, maybe we can ask Eric, this is what he meant, the tension between two different engagement with the past, with the tradition, with the text that needs to be there. Once we lose that tension, according to J.G. Smith, we're gonna lose the persistence of the sacrality, which means the religion is gonna die. And I find it really interesting that I find that in Jay-Z Smith, but also in debate texts from pre-modern Japan, that these debate authors are doing what J.G. Smith is describing as open and close. So that I think is to me is the most interesting paradoxical and interesting aspect of the exegetical tradition of Buddhist debate in medieval Japan. But I'd love to learn more about uh, what's happening with the rabbinical tradition because that's, that's different. There are a lot of common uh, kind of comparison points that we can talk about, Gil, but the fact that you said God can intervene, wow. <laughs> That's not quite the case in the Buddhist debate tradition. So this would be a wonderful comparative um, analytical uh, conversation that we can have. Thank you so much. So much fun. Well, we, we kind of, there's some kind of interesting in, in medieval Christianity inherited from the late antique uh, thinker Augustine. Uh, there's a, a very sort of fundamental theory uh, uh, or method of interpretation, whatever, of interpretation that says, you know, any one sacred text can have, probably does have multiple meanings, which multiple meanings may vary according to the reader. Uh, and all those are meanings infused in the text by God himself. Uh, different people access them. Uh, but as long as they're all led by love, the magic question being what the hell does love mean, then they're, all, in other words, not as long as they're led by love, I apologize, as long as they're conducive to loving God and loving neighbor, again, whatever that means, uh, then they're all correct. But that the point is, uh, I think that's a fabulous uh, theory of interpretation, which some postmodern people, I always thought, might, might want to jump in on. Uh, there's enormous flexibility to the text with both and Sisyphus on a canon, but opens up the canon to probably as many interpretations as there are people whose interpretation leads to love, which for many of the people is going to be almost, well, it's going to go on forever. Thank you. Um, and so uh, I want to just first off, uh, thank you for this, this really wonderful presentation. And just to kind of highlight that um, the work that, um, you know, I'm, I'm familiar, a little bit more familiar with Buddhist studies, uh, other than uh, 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 Adia, who's also uh, within this field too. But I think just to, to point out that um, this is such innovative work, I think, uh, that there's nobody else really working on on this material and i think it's just it's so fascinating that you're you're working on this so thank you for for sharing this with us um and so i have a kind of a comment and then that's gonna uh, hopefully lead into a question too but um you mentioned uh when you were discussing joke this uh very interesting phrase of licking the uh, precious medicine of nectar only to exacerbate the sickness of affliction and i was uh it kind of reminded me of this scene in the uh in the tengu scrolls um, where there is a, a scene that critiques uh, debate, um, uh, particularly the, the type of, uh, you know, the, the activities that the monastics are doing. And at the very end of the scroll, you see um, the, uh, the Kofukuji Kami, the local deities, are feeding uh, nectar to uh, the monastics who have then turned into a demonic figure. Um, so, uh, I, so I was I was curious if you if you knew uh, of this particular um, scene and whether you you knew uh, of the relationship between the text because I think that would be a really interesting connection, uh, thinking about um, you know a corruption and then debate and then specific um, the nectar. Um, wow, so, I didn't know. Thank you. 
So, so, uh, but uh, I, I guess it's recorded, so I can't say don't quote me on it, but um, I'll, I'll have to. Uh, I'll, I'll check. I'll definitely check. This is very interesting. It's a really interesting uh, uh, scene. So I'm not sure if it's exactly nectar, but there's the the Kasuga deity is feeding uh, the 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 tengu, and it's supposed to be a very stark critique of uh, of debate culture. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that kind of led me to this question of, um, you know, I think there's this really fascinating question of the paradox of debate itself, but then. Also thinking that um, there's other functions of these debates as well, right? Uh, including that uh, these debates are supposed to be forms of entertainment uh, for the mm -hmm. god, um, and um, that, uh, uh, and then I, I think there's this other kind of um, uh, section, uh, part of it, where um, there's a famous story of people at, at um, Koyasan who, um, the uh, again, they were having uh, problems with uh, with monastics who uh, with behavior issues. And, um, and they decided to uh, reinstate debate uh, as a way to control behavior. Uh, so there's this kind of more social function as well. And then now you have two different kind of Buddhist institutions that I uh, assume are working under different, um, uh, slightly different uh, uh, you know, uh, rubrics in terms of how the debates are run. So I was just wondering if you could uh, kind of tell us a little bit more of, of uh, kind of the, the multiple functions of debate uh, and then also, if you see, um, uh, as as uh, if if you're interested in seeing, and if if you've looked at other uh, denominations of Buddhism, and to see if if there's any kind of communication between um, the uh, negotiations of these limitations um, and of inter interdenominationally, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for these wonderful questions. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right that the debate played multiple functions uh, in the medieval Buddhist world or medieval Japan in general. And I think you already pointed out the entertainment aspect, uh, which is true as Eric pointed out that the debate was performed. And this, in this case, usually the format that was used was not lecture and question, but it's called pair debate. And sometimes children play the roles of debaters. So it's, it's for entertainment and it's an offering to gods as Eric pointed out. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Um, and in terms of debate as a means to reinstitute the order, right? That's very interesting because this brings us back to the origin of Buddhist debates in Japan, where the state-sponsored debates were instituted in early Heian period by the state in order to institute that order of monastic promotion. So from the very beginning, there was that desire for the state to control and support those two things always <laughs> come together, right? Um, so uh, control and support the monastic population by regulating, and this is where I'm sounding too Foucauldian probably, but power knowledge basically, right? Um, so regulating what counts as knowledge, as legitimate monastic Buddhist knowledge with the power of the state. But I also think that what's interesting is that for me, in addition to this function that you pointed out, that the debate can be used as a, with the, by the, those with the power to regulate the monastic society. This also was a means for monastic society, monks, scholar monks by themselves, um, to organize the system of power. Mm -hmm. So it was never like just top down, top down. So that was really interesting that you pointed out that at Koyasan, the debate was reinstituted as a way of their self-discipline then, right? So that's a really, really interesting history of power slash knowledge and discipline. Um, and finally, uh, interdenominational relationships. So this is where you and I should really talk uh, because I'm really, um, I've been, mostly primarily uh, focusing on interdenominational, intersectarian debates among exoteric schools. Mm -hmm. So in Japan, there was this category, uh, esoteric and exoteric Buddhism. And the kind of Buddhism that Eric studies, esoteric Buddhism, is uh, different from exoteric schools that I study. So for me, for my monks, there's definitely the intersectarian conversation going on among different schools and that contributed to both, um, both sort of developing the distinction between different schools. So developing the doctrinal differences, the doctrinal development, um, but also intensifying the competition among these schools. Now, I'm really curious and I, I want to think more about 
the relationship between exoteric and esoteric then, and also the development of debate within the esoteric Buddhism, which didn't happen until much later, like 12th century. So these are wonderful homework that you gave me. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Before we do transition, I want to thank uh, um, Asuka uh, Sango, uh, Dr. Sango, again, for your wonderful uh, talk. It was really, uh, really great to have you here. Um, and we've kind of saved this, uh, this final um, uh, 25 minutes or so um, to really open it up since we kind of have to rush through all of these uh, really wonderful presentations. And I think we've kind of all seen um, uh, really interesting ways in which uh, our presentations intersect with each other, especially under this kind of rubric of paradox. So um, this is meant uh, to open things up uh, and, um, uh, and yes, and, and, uh, and today the, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Jose, uh, who is the director of ACTI, uh, who has uh, supported our, uh, our, our symposium today. And he's going to be um, uh, Dr. Jose Garcia Moreno, uh, who will be a moderator uh, for this final section. Uh, so I look forward to the, uh, uh, to the discussion. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for uh, this engaging uh, debate. I am really enthused uh, with energy. And I would like to thank, obviously, Anna and Eric from uh, bringing Acti along into this fascinating journey. And thank you, everyone, for, because this is what uh, Acti is looking for, for uh, this generative force of interdisciplinarity. So before I, I turn the table, uh, on to, uh, to our Q&A. Let me just give you a little bit of uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my thoughts during uh, all these fascinating presentations. And I want to start with uh, um, something that actually Shakespeare wrote, I must be cruel only to be kind, which actually he, he wrote in Hamlet. And paradox actually uh, inhabits liminal spaces, as it was said during one of our presentations. The motion of the mind is interstitial. And there's no logical contradiction in Hamlet, uh, and therefore there's no logical paradox. So the character of Hamlet, however, combines these disparate attributes of kindness and cruelty. So his personality is lo loosely paradoxical. What it really uh, came through me through, uh, through the day is that paradox is always in motion. And as Ray Tall mentioned in his presentation of computer science, a string and code of stop, stop, will run forever, right? So there's like this sense of circularity in every paradox and circularity of Aramaic incantation bowls. The incantation bowl is circular and refers motion in its own design. Although I must say that the circle is an impossibility and that a circle is an impossibility because the origin cannot go back to its own original point which will invalidate the, invalidate the idea of motion inherent in creation. Hence, the image of the spiral is the only truthful manifestation of a pretended circularity. Two dragons intertwining, right, as if it was mentioned, making the void visible, the silence into sound, or even as Jill Klein described, an inter, interdimensional divorce because demons are within and without, and we must keep the furies held in the middle of the city. Wrathful desire, as Eric mentioned, is hidden inside as a generative force, which propels and restrains at the same time enlightenment. The hidden figure of ice and mieux, the unwrathful deity of desire ignites a primordial fire with a disc of blazing light. It is, as Eric said, a generative force. Everything is expanding and collapsing, starting with breathing and morality. And no wonder that anxiety or shortness of breath is the sign of our times. A Chinese folktale tells of a blacksmith who created the best armor and weapons in the world. He once created a spear that could pierce any object. He then created a shield that could deflect any attack. When a young boy asked him what would happen if he tried to pierce a shield with a spear, the blacksmith realized he could not answer. The Chinese character for paradox is a spear next to a shield. Close your eyes or you will not be able to see, says Ali's looking at the audience in this modern film adaptation 
of the novel of Lewis Carroll made by Czech filmmaker Jan Schrank Meyer. Isn't it a requisite to close the eyes to see the mind? Shouldn't we forget our own self to become fully aware of, of the self? As Hannah, Anna Harrison mentioned, in love we are indistinguishable from God. Imagination is not reductive, says Ray Tall. A sentence that quotes entirely itself will have to be shorter than itself. The Tao that can be named is not the real Tao. In 3D computer graphics, some sometimes called CGI, there are graphics that use three-dimensional representation of geometrical data, often Cartesian, that is stored in the computer for the purposes of performing calculations and rendering 2D images. The shaded three-dimensional object must be flattened so that the display device, namely a monitor, can display, can display it in only two dimensions. This process is called 3D projection. This is done using projection and for most applications, perspective projection. So the basic idea behind perspective pro projection is that objects that are further away are made smaller in relation to those that are closer to the eye. We are not merely looking at a two-dimensional surface. Our mind accepts a two-dimensional pattern and then pulls high-dimensional notions. An object meaning is not localized within the object itself. And as time passes, more and more of the meaning unfolds. What is, what is it that we respond to when we look at a painting and feel its beauty? Some questions have no solution. Does David Kovacs have an answer to the question of the sacramental paradox? I don't know. It is important to see the distinction between perceiving oneself and transcending oneself. You can gain visions of yourself in all sorts of ways. You can look at yourself in the mirror or watch a film about your own life, but you cannot quite break out of your own skin and be outside of yourself. A computer program can modify itself, but it cannot violate its own instructions. This drive to jump out of the system lies behind all progress and all paradoxes. Jumping out is determined by the quest for complete objectivity, which according to the Epimenides paradox will be impossible. This sentence is false. The resolution involves ab abandoning the notion that a brain could ever provide the full accurate representation for the notion of truth. A total modeling of truth is impossible for quite physical reasons. Namely, such a modeling would require physical incompatible events to occur in a brain. The music interpreter works by setting up a multidimensional cognitive structure, a mental representation of the piece, which it tries to integrate with pre-existing information by finding links to other multidimensional mental structures which encode previous experiences. As this process takes this place, the full meaning gradually unfolds, says Hofstadter. Shouldn't we perceive religion the same way? Is God and creation in constant evolution? What will happen when we will jump out of the system called homo sapiens into a post-human condition? Weren't all Christ teachings contra natura? Put the other cheek, leave, every, leave everything behind and follow me, love your enemies. Self-awareness is a contradictory path that goes through the eye of a needle. In Zen, there is also preoccupation with the concept of transcending the paradox of the system. Tozan tells his monks in the koan, the higher Buddhism is not Buddha. So my first question, if he's still here for Pierre Jardin, is can God make a stone so heavy that he can't lift? Pierre Jardin. <laughs> God would simply uh, float the stone. <laughs> Wouldn't lift it, would use water and uh, water would eventually wear it down and float it. It's the best answer I could give you. I just wanna ask uh, Eric and, um, and Asuka if uh, there's something that you were saying about debate as a form of entertainment and debate as a, uh, as a way to control behavior, right? 
And uh, in, in classical comedy, Western comedy, uh, comedy is used also as a way to control transgression, social transgression, right? So uh, French comedy, the, the two big schools, French and British comedy, French comedy is used more as a, as a moral fable and British comedy is used to control social transgression through exaggeration of character. And the, the, both of them actually, the way that we use comedy is that we laugh at the misery of others. So my question is, if the picture of hell of, of dissection is somewhat comedic or is only horrific in the standards of medieval Japanese audience? Oh my goodness, that's a wonderful question. Eric, do you wanna, do you wanna start? Um, sure. Uh, so I, I don't, uh, I think uh, Asuka should uh, focus on, um, you know, answer, answer the, on that particular uh, painting, but I, I love the question. Um, uh, and I, I actually uh, tend to, I think that there is a comedic uh, element to the, uh, the depictions of hell. And I'm going to uh, go back to the, uh, the picture scrolls of the, the, the demons that I mentioned. Uh, that's, uh, I think, a, a very funny uh, scene. I think the uh, the ne uh, the nectar that's being fed from the gods to the the goblins, the monastics who turn into the, the goblins. I think um, uh, it's it's there's supposed to be a comedic uh, element to that. Uh, and I think that um, uh, you know thinking about um, controlling and, uh, and and behavior and the the use of comedy. Uh, there's other parts of that particular picture scroll that um, uh, kind of highlights uh, performance, uh, different types of dance. Uh, sarugaku and dengaku is another one. Uh, it's kind of uh, what you, we might call like folk dance where people act as if they were monkeys. Um, and I think these, are, these scenes are dispersed um, within uh, this uh, scroll that's uh, critiquing uh, monastic um, uh, disobedience. So um, this relationship between um, obedience, control, uh, entertainment uh, and debate, uh, I think, is is actually a really dynamic um, uh, reality of medieval Japan. And I think uh, actually one of the the issues that I, I I have when picking something up like the devil uh, the 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 Tengu scrolls is that uh, uh, scholars tend to take it a little bit too seriously. Uh, and I think when you kind of open your eyes to the comedic uh, elements of it, I think it really does open up for uh, a new interpretation. I think just in the same way that paradox does. So. Uh, thank you for uh, for that uh, observation. I think Eric is absolutely right. And thank you for that question, Jose. Um, so we don't know too much about who made that scroll that includes the image of the, the hell of that section. So we can't make assumptions about how that was received, what the intention was. Um, however, uh, uh, I can say something about the story, the narrative that I shared with you, the story of the debate hell. So the entire collection of Shasekishu Sand and Pebbles, and especially the stories about scholar monks uh, included in that collection were really funny. Um, so for example, I, I can think of um, an example where, so there's a debate going on between ant and tick. And they are imitating stellar monks that they have seen somewhere. And they're trying to imit also imitate the kind of language going back to what Eric said earlier, that the scholars would do that they would, they would sound really serious. And yet they're really talking about the minute point of doctrines. Um, and that's supposed to be super funny. So I would think that kind of satirical um, power uh, was very important in Shasekishu for the author Muju to use that to then criticize the Buddhist establishment. So the power of satire is definitely there. Thank you for your question. Oh, um, oh sorry. Oh, guilt. Please go ahead. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Jose, for uh, summarizing uh, or commenting, uh, exegeting on our uh, discussion so eloquently and tying all these um, lines together. It's, it's uh, extraordinary. And I'm really happy that it ended with comedy uh, because I think there is something uh, that is absolutely paradoxical about comedy uh, itself. And that's specifically through the, the lens of uh, uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, the, uh, the, the Russian the literary critic, um, who speaks about comedy and satire um, as, uh, as the form, as the genre that has a double voice, that it's the voice that is, uh, there's the official voice of the author or the speaker, um, who often has very serious intentions. And then there's also the um, self-criticizing voice, the doubting voice that is from the same author uh, and the author sometimes is not even aware of, uh, but uh, ridicules itself. And there are multiple examples for this, even in uh, classical literature and philosophy, Plato in a way satirizes Socrates. So um, what does that mean, right? His hero, um, but, uh, and it's true very much to the Talmud. There's a whole book called um, uh, Socrates and the Fat Rabbis uh, by Daniel Boyarin, who does exactly that, who, who speaks about the way the Talmud ridicules the rabbis, its, its main heroes as a form of doubt, as a form of calling things into question, um, as a form of dialogue, as a form of uh, debate. Um, on the other hand, um, there is a book that just came out uh, by Simon Critchley about tragedy, uh, the philosopher Simon Critchley. And he says the tragedy is itself a paradox. It does not solve questions it raises them, it uh, pits one against the other um, different truths, uh, divine truth versus human truth, uh, uh, truths of loyalty to parents versus loyalty to rules of the city and so on. Uh, and it doesn't answer them. So these two um, theatrical dimensions, I think uh, modes uh, are very relevant to what we're doing. And I want to end, I don't want to uh, monopolize this, but I want to end, I have to, uh, with another Greek um, element that very much comes out of theater um, and becomes part of the city, which goes back to um, what um, Dr. Swanson and, and Dr. Sango were talking about in terms of um, the debate as a mean to control conflict. Uh, and especially when it comes to interdenominational tensions or debates or disagreements, uh, and the debate becomes an arena. And that goes to this um, old but wonderful um, concept in, uh, in the Greek polis of agon competition. And I think that it's the almost the manifestation of paradox. It's the division that brings people together, right? It's the fact that they are not the same that makes them part of the same. Um, and so, and, and it's a very significant political tool as well, um, but it's a, it's a way to kind of maintain the balance between uh, heaven in some ways and uh, a complete breakdown of, of the city. Right? And so it maintains tension, it contains it, but it turns it into um, competition. It domesticates it. So there I'm going to stop because I, yeah. Thank you, Gil, for that. Um, do I have a, a second there? Uh, okay. Um, so, um, one other thing, just to, uh, if, if someone has a question, then if not, I can actually throw uh, another ball there into the, the arena. I, I was wondering, uh, 
again about hell of the section i'm sorry that i i, I have like two first observations on that it's really fascinating and uh, i was wondering if uh the, 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 the difference between uh, what Gil actually explained to us in terms of uh, the, 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 the way in which we inhabit this reality with demons, right? Uh, it seems that in a way, it's not the same kind of idea that it's shown in, uh, in Hell of Dissection, because uh, what, in, in my perception is that, uh, those monks are thrown out of time, right? It, it becomes the punishment is that the paradox is gone, right? And it, 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 it feels that they have been driven out of time. So they are out of the motion of the paradox, which is almost like a glitch in a program that just keeps repeating itself. And it comes back again and again, just like a, this kind of gift that it's just like, a, it's eternal. So there's like no way out of it. And I was thinking that, is it, is it you go to hell because you get tenure or because you don't get tenure? <laughs> was that an existential question for all of us? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so is, is hell in, in terms of Buddhism uh, out of time? Is, is it, is, or is it in, in uh, inter intertwined with re, with with life? Maybe I'll ask for help from Eric. Um, so I think I never thought about this. No, before. I think that's it. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that's a really uh, again a fascinating question, and um, I think that in, in my understanding of Buddhist hell. Uh, almost um, the assumption of any presentation of hell is that there's a way out, uh, and that it's not a eternal damnation, but there is a period of time that you have to spend in hell. Uh, and once you've uh, overcome, you've kind of paid your dues, then you have your next shot uh, moving up the ladder. Uh, there's one exception of that, uh, which is the lowest uh, form of hell, but um, generally, uh, I think it's pretty, um, uh, it's, it's understood that it's a temporary, uh, it's still within the concept of time. Uh, and it's an important point because there's this notion, I think that Asuka also mentioned, uh, Dr. Sanko mentioned of, of the um, uh, transfer of merit. Um, so if somebody does uh, go to hell, then it's, it's up to the people who are left uh, in kind of our collective society to do certain rituals uh, and transfer the merit so that they can come back, right? So. Um, I think it, in that sense, it is a very dynamic um, uh, relationship um, and, and a connected, deeply connected relationship to uh, the living world. Excellent. I wonder, we, talking about time, I guess we're running uh, very close out of time. If I just, oh, uh, German, if you, uh, you have your, uh, your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit to that about hell. Um, in terms of the medicine Buddha, it's, it says in his text that he is one Buddha who will actually intercede for you and uh, help remove you from hell. Uh, getting removed from hell, I often compare to the life of a cockroach. If you're a cockroach, how will you get out of that life? It's almost impossible. Uh, and it's a bit like that for beings who are in hell, but they do uh, get out eventually. Of course, there is also the idea in Buddhism that hell, uh, the six realms, hell, hungry ghosts, animals, humans, uh, gods and dem demigods and gods, are all in fact part of the same system that can be external to us, but also can be internal. So in one Zen story, uh, uh, a Zen uh, samurai goes to a Zen master and says, tell me about heaven and hell. And the Zen master says, uh, what, what an idiot like you could know anything about Zen. So he pulls out his sword to kill the master and the master said there opens the gates of, he of hell and when he puts the sword back in he says here we are at the gates of heaven so uh, in some ways it also lasts uh, internally and externally i guess i should leave it up to our uh, our panelists our speakers or the audience if they have some uh concluding remarks if they want to uh... I'll hand it oh. over to, to Eric. So, um, yeah, wonderful. Uh, so uh, thank you again. I do, I do have uh, some concluding remarks uh, as we kind of finish up our date. Um, so 
Uh, I want to first, uh, again, thank, uh, give my uh, deepest thanks to the director of uh, ACTI, uh, Dr. Jose Garcia Moreno and Emilio Reyes, uh, with, without whom this would uh, not have been possible. And your final reflections was just a, a beautiful way of wrapping everything up. So, um, so thank you. Um, and uh, and I, I think that um, uh, I want to acknowledge how kind of fortunate we are um, uh, with this. And I think there's just something really special about LMU as a place that kind of allowed this to happen. Uh, so I wanted to, to recognize that. Um, and when Anna uh, suggested that we open this up uh, to kind of have a call for papers, uh, in, an interdisciplinary, uh, I'm going to be honest and say I was a little bit skeptical of whether we're going to have the, the interest uh, for this. And when we did have uh, all of you send in your calls for proposal, it was just uh, such a delight uh, and to see uh, this kind of uh, all come together in this way. So thank you, uh, everybody, um, for uh, your participation, especially at this very busy time of the, of the year. Um, I also uh, say that it's uh, a pure joy to have Dr. Oscosango with us as a keynote speaker. Um, I, I know, again, it was uh, we're taking uh, time out of your busy schedule. So thank you so much. It was really great to have you here. Um, and so as I reflect on, on all the presentations, uh, just one takeaway for me is to simply acknowledge the, the profound possibility of paradox uh, as a way not only to analyze the world, but also to experience the world, uh, regardless of the differences in our disciplines and our training. So seeing uh, paradox not only as a reflection of reality uh, as we and others experience, uh, but also paradox as a generative force that has the power to create uh, new creative perspectives uh, that help us kind of re engage with the world. Uh, and I think that's kind of uh, something that I really got from today. And I like to kind of end today's symposium with a quote from what I, uh, who I believe is one of the most powerful voices in American Buddhism today, uh, Zen teacher, Angel Kildo Williams. So in her book, uh, Radical Dharma, she shares her thoughts on transformative social change uh, in connection to paradox. Uh, so in her words, uh, quote, all truth is paradox. What it is to live in a space of transformative change is to engender greater and greater comfort with paradox. So that paradox becomes something that we not only acknowledge, but also live more truthfully. We discover that truth is relationship and relationship is. So thank you again for spending time with us today and to build uh, these relationships so we can uh, live in community and uh, continue to, to uh, reflect on paradox in our uh, respective uh, traditions. And we hope to have another uh, chance to uh, see you all again, hopefully in person uh, before too long. So uh, thank you again, everybody for uh, spending the, the day with us today. <laughs>